let me just get my curse words out. And, you know, this will this will probably frame the discussion as we go into the intro and stuff like that. This movie is so fucking boring. It's the cure for insomnia. I had to watch it in fucking goddamn installments of 40 minutes each. And I paid dearly in interest. And no, I'm not talking about monetary interest. I'm talking about my physical, mental interest in Star Wars. You guys have ruined me. You guys were good when it was like, oh, Rob, I'll get you on for an episode of The Mandalorian. I'll get you on for a fucking episode of Book of Django, Boba, Booba, Douchebag, Fat, whatever the fuck that shit was called. It all sucked. I was happy remembering my childhood with the prequel trilogy being fine with it. But now you made me rewatch it. You made me sit through this, dude. It took me four fucking sittings to get through Attack of the Clones this morning. That's how long I fucking put this shit off for. I was dreading this goddamn nonsense. This movie is garbage. Star Wars, I don't understand why you people find it interesting. And yeah, I'm going there. You people. It is so fucking boring. It is so mind-numbingly painful. I cannot fucking understand you guys. Okay, that's my rant. All my curse words are out. I will meter those thoughts throughout the episode, as I'm sure. But now, Zach, if you're ready... If you want to start the episode with the intro, I will be clean as a whistle from here on out. And Zach, this is a podcast about cinematic oddities where we discuss any media that is too bizarre, abnormal, or off kilter for contemporary audiences. Occasionally, these projects gel, most times, they crash hard into their own obscurity. Join us as we delve into the cult classic swamp. I'm Zach, and I love democracy, I love the republic. Oh, I hey, maybe if anybody who's seen the title of this episode. They said, Rob has to say the sand quote at the start of this. No, no, I'm not going to say the sand quote. That's way too easy. And I'm sure we have much to say about the uh, I don't like sand quote in this movie. But with the Star Wars aspect of this being put aside for now, I would like to say at the very beginning of this episode, we are kicking off a new series. And not only is it a series, it is a fort month. It is a fort month of Zack's choosing. Zach, correct me if I'm wrong, but with the next two months, with a break in between, because you have done some weird things in the spreadsheet, we will be covering the summer blockbusters of 2002, just like we did for the summer blockbusters of 2001 last year. Is that correct? That's correct, Rob, except this one is uh, not half a year. It's two months. It's Yes, yes. So it's a fort month in the truest terms, of course, of course. <laughs> and what better way to kick off this new series, this fort month, than, uh, well, uh, Zach might say, what better way to kick it off than with Star Wars? What better way that I think to kick it off with one of our best guests on Cinemodities, somebody who really knows how to talk about the topics at hand. It is none other than Chris. You might remember him from very recently, the Urban Legend episode where he tried to run the table on that. Very thankfully. Very thankfully, Chris did a great job. But so much thank you for being here to uh, talk on a real episode of Cinemodities. Yeah, very happy to be here to celebrate the 20th anniversary of one of the most interesting things that has ever happened in the film industry. I, I, I fell asleep a little bit while you were saying that. I, I'm very tired from watching this movie, I have to say. Um, so with all that being said, I don't think there's much else we need to say to set the stage. I don't think we need to set the stage on the 2002 Fort Month anymore. I think anybody can look back in the annals of history, on uh, whether it be you know IMDb, Box Office Mojo. You might get a sense of what we're going to cover in this series. I think, Zach, you and I, we've given it away uh, You know, a few months ago. We, are, we will be covering Men in Black 2. That's not a spoiler, but anybody can figure out what else we're talking about. But really, Zach is here. Chris is here as our guest host. I have to take a little bit of backseat because we're talking Star Wars. And whenever we talk Star Wars, I am the filthy casual of the group. So, Zach, 
I mean, why even ask the usual question? Why even ask the usual question of why are we discussing this movie? I think it's very clear to everybody in the cinema audience that the kickoff of this series of the 2002 Fort Month had to be Attack of the Clones, one of the biggest movies of 2002 financially and for both of my hosts here, I'm sure. Oh, absolutely, Rob. Uh, the only thing is that we would have done Spider-Man if we didn't do that back in November. That would have been the true <laughs> kickoff to uh, 2002 You summer. did say that to me once where I think I mentioned to you, I was like, oh, I'm like, Zach, okay, you kicked this, uh, you kicked the 2002 Fort Mon off with Spider-Man. You were like, no, Rob, we did that last November. It was Sam Raimi's Spider-Man, our longest episode ever. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. So, no, technically the true kickoff of 2002 summer is Spider-Man. Um, uh, really can, can we all agree? I mean, let's go around the room. Um, I, I'll speak for everybody here. An objectively better movie than this one. Sam Raimi's Spider Hyphen Man is objectively better than Star Wars: Attack of the Clones. Uh, do we I'm burn him at the stake, Chris? Do we I'm burn him at for the stake? No, 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 no. You don't. You guys don't have to say anything. I'm speaking for everyone. We can just continue from there. So please. <laughs> Well, Rob, this is one thing I want to ask. Like, what is your context to this? Because I'm pretty uh, sure at some point in Knights of Vader's five year history, I, I've explained <laughs> the Attack of the Clones context for myself. Yeah. What is yeah. your context of this movie? So, uh, yeah, I I knew you're going to ask this. Uh, it's it's no. I'm no stranger to the Knights of Vader podcast or on here on Cinemodities. I've said before, I was a big Star Wars fan when I was a kid. As Zach knows, as Zach has visual, visually seen, you know, has visual evidence of, I have a lot of Star Wars action figures. I love the toys, that type of thing. My parents, mostly my dad, really was into Star Wars and got me into it when I was younger, and I kind of took a huge liking to it. And back in the day, 1999, 2002, 2005, when Revenge of the Sith came out, I was all about it. Like, it was my thing. I love Star Wars, you know? But eventually, I grew out of it, which we might have to talk about more in the episode. But at the time, in 2002, man, I know I saw this movie in theaters with my dad. Was my mom there? No recollection of that. This was me and my dad's type of thing, you know? And I remember loving the absolute hell out of this movie back in the day i don't think i've seen attack of the clones maybe since 2008 or something i i have not rewatched it for any reason prior to that but i loved it back in the day and that's why prior to our uh, starting this recording i was like i hate you i hate you guys you zach and chris for making me rewatch this movie and ruining my nostalgia for it because it I it really it really was a tough thing to get through for me this time. So does that answer your question, Zach? That's my context. I loved it when I was a kid, but I grew out of Star Wars. I think that's the best way to say it. Rob, is this your equivalent to the Amanda show? Like in Star Wars terms? Yeah, it it kind of is. I'm actually glad you said that because the Amanda show is around the same time period, early 2000s, where I thought it was the funniest thing in the world back in the day. And then when re when you and I rewatched it for this podcast, we were like, "This is cringe inducing nonsense." And I don't I don't want to say that. Well, I maybe we'll get into it. I kind of do think Hayden Christian's performance and some of the dialogue with the love aspect of this movie is very cringe inducing. I might as go as far to say that it is an exemplar of toxic masculinity. I mean, let me just rip the Band-Aid off. There's a scene where Hayden Christensen as Anakin Skywalker says, Padme, you're making me so horny I'm about to bust. And since you're not letting me bust, I'm in pain, and all that pain's your fault. And I'm like, this is what, like, 13-year-old kids say to their girlfriends. And I'm like, that's not the best thing, right? Um, I, and so, yes. Uh, this well, is he's, he's supposed to be 18, to be fair. I I mean, doesn't that make it cringier if an eighteen year old is saying you're making me horny? He's like, yeah, but he's like me in pain. Aren't yeah, but you he's in like, pain? Aren't you horny too? And it's like, slow your roll. Let a let a woman make her own choice. Okay. <laughs> well, he's a, he's an eighteen year old who's like lived. He's lived as an altar boy for his whole life, basically. So he's messed up with a laser sword, though. That that's all on you guys. That's all that information is all on you guys. I don't have that information. As far as I'm concerned, I watched Attack of the Clones for this recording. 
independent of every other Star Wars movie. The only other Star Wars movie I really remember is Return of the Jedi because it's the best one. And um, that basically has no bearing on the events of this movie because it comes after, of course. Uh, don't, okay, I'm sorry. I don't want to be, you know, a total plebeian here. <laughs> Chris, okay, Chris. There, there's a lot to unpack there. Like I said, <laughs> there's the most raw episode, monologue. Well, take the it whatever direction you want. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting for me is I was I was talking I was actually uh, talking to my brother about this uh, the other day because I'm finally at that age where I can like thoroughly remember things that happened 20 years ago. I don't like it, but uh, I remember I was like, what did I? What was my initial reaction to this movie when it first came out? And I remember very vividly, I was talking to my cousin who's about, I don't know, like seven years older than me. And he's, he, he was like always into, he, he was kind of like my gateway into like Star Wars nonsense. And I remember talking to him, it was maybe a week after we both saw it. And he, he said something like implying that it really mirrored the story of The Empire Strikes Back. And the only reason I remember this is because I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> right? I don't know. I, did, I, I thought there were, I thought it was completely, I thought it was strange, but it was like, it, what was weird to me is like, I remember really enjoying it in theaters and it was just like my first exposure to like a sort of cynical, I immediately hate this sort of attitude. <laughs> like it, it wasn't strong, but it was like, I was, it was cause I, I don't know. I must have, I probably was like 13, I guess, or something. So like I was pretty into it. Um, I, I remember really enjoying it in theaters. Uh, Rob's right about a lot of a lot of the dialogue that there, like Lucas has sort of made excuses for some of it since then contextually talking about how like, you know, kind of the defense I was just trying to make, like but, you gotta understand is... how emotionally unintelligent Anakin is, which that's like, I think that's a sort of a post talk argument for not very good dialogue. Sure. But I, I, don't right want, I don't want to diminish the fact that there is a an actual line of dialogue in this movie where Anakin says, I'm so tight, I'm about to bust, you know? Like, that happens in this movie, oh, as far God. as I'm concerned. It was one of the only moments I was awake for it. Zach, see, Zach see that literally put his hands to his head. <laughs> yeah. See, that, that didn't get me as much as, like, the stuff that gets me in this is, like, when, when, they're, when they're driving the, the, during, like, the speeder chase near the beginning, Obi-Wan's like, how many times have I told you not to drive through power couplings and they're being electrocuted by the power couplings? And I'm like, how many times has this situation happened? <laughs> what is this? What is this sentence about? Why is he even talking while he's being electrocuted? You know, so stuff like that is what stands out to sure, me. Like, sure. I can accept that Anakin's like sort of a terrible person already on the path to like this self-destruction. Right. So. So like you know, it's like the droid factory scene, and like the some of the stuff Obi Wan does. Like I do remember even when I was like thirteen watching this. Like when he when Obi Wan just like jumps out the window with like no regard for what how that's going to play out from there. <laughs> like it's a decision that's like unparalleled in like any of these other movies. Really, it's just like I'm just going to jump out the window of this Coruscant building, like <laughs> yeah, and try and grab that thing. That's like I don't know. I, I mean. I guess if you watch the all of the prequels all the way through, you get the sense that Jedi are capable of silliness like that. But I remember it like it seemed an order of magnitude crazier than anything they did in episode one when I was watching it. So like that whole scene of just like Anakin jumping out of flying cars, like hoping it works out for the best <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> You well, know. I'm I'm glad you bring up the sense that you think it's crazier, and I think that's something I wanted to ask you guys, is that, because for years now, I think, um, maybe not, well, years in the in the actual chronology of it, but, like, there's a good handful of episodes where I am on Knights of Vader, and we talk about, you know, the, um, the cultural standing, you know, of Star Wars movies. I, I think the best example um, was from, what, a year and a half ago or whatever, and we did the um, statistical analysis episode, Zach, you know, that type of thing. And it was, like, overwhelmingly in that, in that absolutely horrible snowball survey that has no statistical grounding, they found that, like, everybody they interviewed or everybody they surveyed hated Attack of the Clones the most. We didn't really get a sense of why they hated Attack of the Clones. Like, it was just a number rating. It wasn't, like, giving reasons, or we didn't have any quant... Uh, qualitative data or anything like that um but i 
I was kind of wondering, do you guys know why does this movie get the most hate? Because the thing that I knew and I want to talk about the most with this is that from everything I know, mostly from you guys talking about it and the very few other people I know who like Star Wars, very few, let me put that in perspective. Um, it's they say like it looks like garbage. They're like the CGI is garbage. And that's something I hear from not you guys. But I don't think this movie looks all that bad. I know Zenger has gone on the rampage of screaming about the story of Sifo Diaz in this movie. He has so many problems with that. That's another thing I remember. But I guess what I wanted to ask you guys, being the Star Wars aficionados that you are, does this movie deserve the hate that it gets? Or does it warrant being the worst film out of nine, if that makes sense? I think I think you could definitively say it's for sure the only Star Wars movie you should really talk about on cinema oddities, like ever. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, Zach. What, what do you think about Last Jedi? I think Last Jedi would be a prime candidate for us to talk about because I, I actually I, have things to say about that movie. That movie does not make me want to fall asleep every second that I'm watching it. <laughs> I will say that at some point, I know everybody wants us in the Knights of Vader Facebook group and other fan channels to be like, yeah, like cover all the movies on Knights of Vader. And I want it noted that we've only technically outside of Last Jedi, Solo, Rise of Skywalker, Attack of the Clones has gotten the most amount of love from us because we did an episode five years ago for the 15th anniversary of Attack of the Clones, but never did one for any of the other films. Um, I, I finally realized like how I'll get the Cinematis treatment for Star Wars films is to plug Rob in to Knights of Vader, other than his typical like him discovering that Boba Fett's writing a Bantha, which will yeah. always be one of the funniest <laughs> moments ever. <laughs> Rob's like, I don't think that was part of that discussion. I was a listener, and I'm just and Rob's like losing his mind discovering that Boba Fett's writing a bantha. Um, <laughs> but to answer the question about this film, is that Attack of the Clones? Because again, I've I've talked a lot about this film over the years. It's this film does it deserve to hate it? Gets no, I don't think any firm film deserves to be hated. Uh, the Zach, prop- please, please please put the um qualifier of dr sleep oh well, yes of course Do- dr sleep you. exception dr sleep this, should be if fr- this was knights of vader only i would not have mentioned that but since this is a cinemodities you know joint venture we have to get that in there okay uh, there yes. is one no, film never that Dr. Sleep. To be stricken from the universe and it is dr yes. sleep absolutely okay yes yes um the thing about Attack of the Clones that is so kind of baffling, this goes to my context in 2002, which I've, I've talked about before, but it's worth bringing up again, is that as a kid in the summer of 2002, Spider-Man comes out that first weekend of May and nobody cared about Star Wars. To a bunch of nine and 10 year olds, nobody cared about Star Wars. And I remember like just like defending a movie I'd never seen before, much of what would happen later in life with the internet, uh, people defending things they'd never watched. And just being like this, no, it's like your your stupid bug movie. No, like I, I had no interest in Spider Man, and just like watching this and I, immediately falling in love with it. It was back during that time we've talked about a few times on Cinemodies where my mother would make me wait to see a movie because it was at the end of the school year. So I was like, no, you can't have fun. It's the end of the school year. You have to be ready for exams. <laughs> so it was like, and it's weird to think of that when you're a nine year old. <laughs> That you can't have fun because you have end of the year exams. Mr. Neustadt needs you to submit 18 rough drafts of the same paper. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a deep cut. Um, uh, no. So like I, I remember eventually seeing it. I don't think I saw it until like June of 2002. And I like at that point, I remember finding the toys in store, like finding the toys in April, as Chris can tell you, during like the launches of all this stuff. And like the toys really being my first gateway um, I think I knew the film was coming out May of 2002 for at least a few months, but the toys, I remember, I can still remember showing up in Walmart, seeing the entire um, back during the glow, <laughs> kind of like Chris's background. Um, we could sit there <laughs> like it was the wall of toys, a phenomenon that most Star Wars collectors remember fondly, but we haven't really seen in earnest in what, a decade plus now, Chris, the the wall of toys. Well, I we got it here in Canada. Yo, sh- get out of here with your Toys R Us. I don't know what, what is... Is that a Star Wars character? Kanata? No, 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 Chris, what Chris, did Chris, you just say? Chris, Chris. What is that phrase? Rob, Chris is talking about the character from Akira. 
Canada. Canada. Oh, oh, you're talking. Okay, okay. Chris wants to do some Akira talk. That works perfectly. Last month, Ben and I did a lot of foreign animation. That's awesome. Okay. Chris, what do you think about Akira? <laughs> I know what that is. <laughs> Chris is like, I'm waiting for the Christopher Nolan, a live action adaptation of it. Uh, excuse me, Zach, Jordan Peele live action Oh, he's the latest adaptation. one attached to it? Uh, yeah, yeah, last I heard, yep, yep. Oh, Jesus. Yep. Um, but no, so Attack of the Clones being like, I was, like, it was the first time ever as a Star Wars fan, I got to be on the hype train. Because it was like, oh, I remember like, again, buy, I remember, I remember just seeing this wall of toys and wanting to buy all of them. And my mother being like, no, you get three. And it was probably one of the most difficult decisions of my life. I put more effort into picking out which three figures of that initial Saga 2 collection of figures than I did probably the college I went to. I just I, – I, I want that known. Like I remember sitting there just being like, oh my god, oh my god. Because I, I, it was like, well, of course I need Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan's my favorite character. And then I want like – again, Chris knows. The, like the lightsaber Anakin where like like the one arm falls off. The other one like the wrist rotates 100, uh, 360 degrees. Oh, I think I had that too. <laughs> well, yeah, but they didn't have that one, so I had to settle for like the peasant disguise Anakin with the stupid like telescoping lightsaber out of the forearm. Are you telling me that your first choice wasn't Watto with a little tiny hat? I eventually Attack got of that. Of course, I got that eventually. <laughs> but that was that's not your that's not your first draft pick, Rob. I you don't blow the first draft, draft pick draft on Watto. Pick. That's my first draft pick. Someone so casually talking about buying and selling slaves is my <laughs> first draft pick. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Um, but that but, stood that, out to me on the rewatch too, Rob. Yeah, that did not stick out to me at all because yeah. I'm like, of course, Watto. Where's sold my mother? Where's my mother? You want to help me, uh, you know, beat up some people that owe me money? No, I want to know where mother is. Ah, I sold her because she's a piece of salami. That's literally the line of dialogue. Put the clip in, everybody, okay? <laughs> business is business. <laughs> Do we know what, ha- what happened to Wild after that? Is there any canon, like, like lore? To I hope he post- got sold to the Tuscan Raiders because the scene is so <laughs> toxic and offensive where he's like, business is business, people are currency. And I'm like... <laughs> I'm like, what the hell is this movie? You, you I mean, are many aware, times you I was, are I said, aware what that, the hell is this movie? You are aware at that moment, Watto's essentially like, essentially like a glorified panhandler, right? Like, he's homeless. Like, he has nothing left. No, I'm not aware of that. I, I literally don't know anything other than what I see in this movie about <laughs> Star Wars. <laughs> That's the deep cut, Rob. Watto is homeless at that moment. Like, yes, he's talking about bartering lies, but he has no life. I thought he was running like a slave empire in this movie. It's in the movie, Rob. You can tell because he's like hopelessly trying to fix something that he would have got one of his slaves to do if he had any left. (laughs) Are you telling me, Chris, that I need to pick up something from a Star Wars movie visually? Because I don't do that. I need to pick it up through 16,000 minutes of exposition. That's the only way I can understand what's going on. (laughs) Drop the mic. (laughs) I broke them them both. Here we go. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Chris just shrugs to the camera. I think uh, the problem was that Rob was only listening to the movie at that point and doing something else. At the my same time. issue was that there was not a long neck clone planet alien describing <laughs> everything going on in the movie at that point, because that's the only point in the movie I was engaged when they were talking about their clone army on the wet planet. And that I mean, there's that and there's one actually like good shot in this movie that is so good. I would make it my background on my computer. Everything else, this was the cure for insomnia. I severely disliked watching this movie. Yeah, oh god, it's gonna be one of those discussions. I it's gonna be one when Rob breaks out the severely this movie. I I I hated this movie. That's why I said it's your guys' episode. You know, pl- so please don't let me steamroll you with how much I hated it. If you want my thoughts, let me throw in throw them in there. But it's all you guys. I mean, Zach and Chris, you might be sick of talking to each other. Maybe you need someone to dissent at this point. But man, this was a this was a tough watch for me. <laughs> but Rob, you are crapping on the least popular Star Wars film of all time. Like you are not providing a hot take right now. I, I know I'm not providing a hot take. You are part of the hegemony. I want you to be aware exactly. of that. Exactly. No, and I'm aware of that from when we did our statistical. You know that bad study showed this as well, and that's what I've known from the internet type of thing. But maybe on that point, one of the things that I wanted to bring up, which I mentioned earlier, I from what I've heard. Other than you guys, you being the Star Wars people, and I am a very regular listener to Knights of Vader, so I, I feel that I'm a little more well-versed in the Star Wars knowledge. Um, it's like 
I would relate it to, it's like me as an English speaker, every week I listen to a Portuguese podcast. I don't understand a lot of the things they're saying, but I get the idea of what they're saying, you know? That's me with Knights of Vader. Something you guys don't talk a lot about, or at least I don't think you talk a lot about, which I've heard a lot of throughout my life, is that Attack of the Clones gets hit really hard, like almost speared through the temple on how terrible the CGI is. And... I have to say, upon this rewatch, as long as there isn't a live-action human in frame, the movie looks really good. (laughs) Like, whenever you have Obi-Wan in front of a green screen or, you know, Anakin in front of a green screen, that looks a little wonky, but that's from the era, 2002, you know, that type of thing. But when we have these grandiose shots of, like, you know, Obi-Wan landing his uh, plane, you know, I don't know what to call it, a spaceship on the uh, wet planet. Jedi starfighter, but proceed. Yeah, okay, wet planet. Jedi starfighter on the wet planet, and then there's a shot on the wet planet where there's like a creature that's under the water, and it breaches the water and flies into the distance. I'm like, this is really cool. This is really imaginative. This is, you know, what seven years before Avatar, where James Cameron was trying to do the same exact thing of these of these small creatures on big flying creatures. I love that stuff. I love the wide angle shots. I love the um, interpretation of basically CGI in place of matte paintings that George Lucas was going for. I love all that. I don't think this movie gets the praise that it does for being so groundbreaking in terms of CGI special effects, not with live action. The integration of live action came much later, but just the idea of creating these wide angle shots, these landscapes, like, they're beautiful. I love the look of a lot of the um, non-human elements of this movie, if that makes sense. I will say there's an incredible shot in this movie. I'm kind of surprised Rob hasn't brought it up yet of like all these backgrounds, whether it be the Kaminoans. I, or... I did say, I did say, Zach, I want to preface before you say it, because you might be thinking the same one. There is one shot in this movie that is unbelievably beautiful that I would make my computer background. Okay. I think I know where we're going. Okay. I, think okay. We're, I, I think want to know, know if you're going to guess it for sure. Okay. I, there, okay. You have some of these moments of some of these like creatures and backgrounds that don't exist in the real world. They are a hundred percent from someone's yes. imagination to a hard drive. And yet there's one moment, one moment that is possibly the most profound shot in star Wars. It should be like a one shot. It's in Palpatine's office where it's Reese and it's a guy in a rubber mask against like a red background. And I'm just like, and it's a flat shot. And I'm just like, I'm <laughs> just like, I like do. that might, that was the only moment in this where I was just like, man, Jorge, like really? <laughs> you needed that shot of Reese explaining to, to Basil Oregano. <laughs> I know Space what politics. shot you're talking about. That was not the shot. I that was wasn't it. About. That was not it. There's it's clearly a, a guy in a rubber mask. But that that is one of my favorite shots in the movie because after after me, you know, looking at Yoda in CGI form and physically feeling my eyes hurt while watching this terrible CGI puppet, and and wishing that it was physical, just because it's not that it would be better if it was practical or physical. It would be better because. There's something about the way that Yoda is animated in this movie that strains my eyes because it's like, it's not conscious. It's not voluntary. It's like, I'm looking at it and it's like my eyes are physically reacting to the uncanny valley, you know, that type of thing. There's another shot in this movie that is 100% wonderfully beautiful that I want to save and put as my computer background. Chris, do you have a guess? Since I feel Zach used his guess on that shot, do you have a guess at what it is? Well, you know, you could, this could go a couple different ways. It could be like a beautiful establishing shot, or it could be something really dumb, like uh Django Fett kicking Obi-Wan and then freeze frame on that. <laughs> it's, it's not, it's not in a fight sequence. I, I guess you might call it an establishing shot. I would call it a wide shot. It is, is of a big, like a sweeping landscape, this shot that I'm, I'm thinking of. Uh well it, maybe I'll maybe I'll guess uh Alderan. I don't know what that is. What is that? <laughs> that is that is the planet that the Death Star destroys at the beginning of a new hope. Is that, that in is this only, movie? At the very end. There yeah. Okay, no, it's no. not that. I'm wrong. No, I'm wrong. Sorry. 
my god, you're gonna have to edit that out. Wait, wait, wait. Right, Chris, I'll, did you I'll, just I'll be booed off the internet. Attack of the Clones, Revenge of the Sith. Yeah, Hold on, I'll let me get my off trivia. Let me get my trivia book. Chris is Chris yeah. is on edge. We need to, we need to hit him when he's down. I'll be canceled. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, guys. Um, yeah, no. Um, if it's not, if it's not that, I'm trying to think because like Geonosis is not beautiful, so it must be. Uh, but Rob likes weird things like that. So like the idea of like having that establishing shot of like the arena as it slowly pans in, like I, I have could created such well, a wonderful you know what? thought experiment. <laughs> now that now that you now that you mention it, the idea of like a couple hundred thousand little bug men might ex- in one shot might excite Rob. So hundred well, like, percent. Like that's something maybe Rob it's would the lose arena. Mind over. Now I feel a little weird that they're talking about me in the third person. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Do you guys want to know what shot I'm thinking of? Sure. Yes. Uh, okay. It is when Anakin on Tatooine is searching for his mother, we get a great at dusk shot of him talking to a Jawa in the foreground. And in the background, you have the gigantic like tractor things that the Jawas use, but they're open in the background. Like you see the lights from the inside and there's a great contrast of orange of the sun setting to the darkness of the foreground with the bright blue lights coming from the insides of those Jawa big ship things yeah. or big tractor things. It is fundamentally beautiful. It is artistic. It is painterly. I love it. And that's one of the moments where I go, this piques my interest. I'm so upset that this two and a half hour movie has literally made me sleep five times before this, but this shot is wonderfully beautiful. Well, you know, that the, that shot's actually, um, I think the primary visual reference point for that was a Ralph McQuarrie painting from the 1996 book the illustrated star wars universe which has been referenced numerous times on this show but he ralph mcquarrie was like the concept painter for the original trilogy but in the mid 90s they they kept him around to do a few uh other projects some a couple books and like he did okay. some product packaging as well and he sort of came up with the idea that the front of the sand crawler would like fold down and you and you could uh see a whole bunch of droid uh manipulation hardware in there so uh so yeah it was cool. yeah. yeah like i remember seeing that uh, in theaters and being like wow they're actually using concepts that were made for books like five years earlier that's cool absolutely no it's it's a it's a beautiful shot i would say it's the most beautiful shot in this movie but that is not to disregard you know all the other wide angle like landscape cgi shots i don't think the cgi in this movie looks bad until it tries to implement human characters. I think that, you know, when Obi-Wan and Anakin are talking in front of the background of Coruscant, like out on a balcony, you are just looking at it and you're going like, this is green screen. This is like Hitchcock 1950s level rear projection type of thing. And it looks weird. It takes you out of it. And I also have to say, Ewan McGregor, uh, sorry, Zach, Ewan McDonald, do you know who I'm talking about now? Okay, thank you, Zach. Now you made it clear. Now, yet yeah, now we're on the same page. Ewan McGregor is one of my favorite actors. I love him. Of course, the year after this, he's in Big Fish. Ben and I have covered Big Fish on Cinematics before, and I talk about how much I love him in that performance. Um, I love Ewan McGregor in the only good season of Fargo, season three. And yes, if Chris and Zach, yep, they clearly, they're looking at their phones. They have no idea what I'm saying. That's a hot take. People will be emailing us very angrily that I say season three is the best season of Fargo. Ewan McGregor's fantastic. Ewan McGregor sucks in this movie. Ewan McGregor clearly does not know what he's reacting to. Like, let me point out the scene. One of possibly the favorite punching bags of cinema in the modern era, the Dexter's Jetster's Diner scene, where Ewan McGregor shows up. You want a cup of Joe's with you? What was that? You want a cup of Joe's with you? I, (laughs) okay. I have a question about that, (laughs) Zach. I thought I watched this movie without subtitles because I don't like to watch things with subtitles. Everybody tune in uh, to last month when Ben and I discuss under the uh, uh, sorry, ghost in the shell. And um, we talk about how shitty subtitles are. Sorry, Zach. Bad subtitles are. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Um, uh, if anything, you should leave that in because subtitles deserve all the hate they can get. Uh, there is no single subtitle file in the world that is accurate. I, I, we proved that. Ben and I actually mathematically proved that in that episode. Um, I thought when she came around, that one wheeled waitress, waitress came around to Obi Wan. She said, "Would you like a cup of Jawa juice?" And I was like, "What's Jawa juice?" 
That'll come back up in snacks later. But back on my original point, the entire scene where Obi-Wan, Ewan McGregor, is sitting across a table from Dexter Jester, an entirely CGI character. And you guys might know better. I don't know what Ewan McGregor was acting against in that moment. But the way a regular that scene, dude, a regular dude with dots on his face for motion capture or was not, not even, even that. that, not even Just, that. Okay. It's the voice actor, I believe. Okay. That even makes it worse than I imagined. But did the because... voice actor pull up their pants as their crack was showing? That is the real question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, um, well, what, Rob, you know, uh, what you might actually find interesting is that yes. the there is one of the behind the scenes documentary on the DVD shows them filming this scene for a few minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. with the with the voice actor standing. I have in, never yeah. seen that. But the thing that I want to bring up is that in that scene, Ewan McGregor is playing it way too happy. Ewan McGregor is like enthralled and gung ho, like, hey, hey, Dexter, I haven't seen you in so long. You know, it's like how I would act to Zach when I see him again in New York. You know, it'd be like, Zach, I haven't seen you in so long. And you're like, and you're like, Rob, we talk to each other every every week. You know, like, what are you talking about? I'm like, Zach, but no, I love you. You know, and I get I get very emotional, that type of thing. That's how Ewan McGregor is playing this with this guy. And Dexter Jester is being the sketchiest person in existence. Oh, I haven't seen this type of tranquilizer dart since I used it on a young girl when I was in the spice mines. And Ewan McGregor's like, yeah, yeah, that's cool. You want to tell me more? And he's like, nobody can find this planet except the pedophiles. <sighs> and it's like, <laughs> okay, okay. I like this fact. I'm going to use this for the rest of the mystery. He's well, so cognitively dissonant. From the two characters are so cognitively dissonant that it breaks the atmosphere of the movie, and I find it atrocious. <laughs> but Rob Dexter says something that is very much in line with your line of thinking. He says, "If droids could think, there'd be no- oh fuck." I, I keep doing so it. God damn it! I am now you have to edit it. Good. That was Obi Wan. All right. My bad. I am so glad you bring that up because yeah. I wanted to highlight that. Absolutely. Yeah. You're right. Because o- Obi-Wan says if droids could think there'd be none of us here, would there? If and that means could, that okay. Obi-Wan, yeah. that means that Obi-Wan believes that droids are, do not have souls. Basically. My, my actual note is that quote. I quoted that exact thing. If droids could think there'd be none of us here, would there? Hyphen, my thoughts. This seems to confirm that droids are stupid and don't deserve any rights at all. <laughs> I mean, Obi Wan. Obi Wan himself said it. What more do you want? The big um, trash can dilemma. It's absolute finest. I, uh, I think. Uh, speaking of that, you know, I don't know if you guys want to harp on the fact that I think, um, uh, oh, you and McGregor's performance is absolutely terrible in this. Maybe we'll get back to that. I also want to harp on the fact that R two D two is a stupid entity in this movie. R two D two is basically like, like a a tool in this movie. I mean. God, is that not what he is throughout most of the well, movies? No, I don't. I don't think so. But that's part of the thing that I also. He's a I magic not, key in A New Hope. This is the this is the only Star Wars movie I've watched since Rise of Skywalker when it came out. Like I'm not saying I'm very well versed in these Star Wars movies. You're, but, you're you know, missing it. You're missing it, man. The R two in this movie does the exact same stuff that he does in the original trilogy. It's literally like. Okay. I need this door open. I, I need this thing turned off. He rushes over there and does it. It's so crazy to think, you know, t- some 20 plus years later, they use a, the the same character in a sequel as it was used in <laughs> old movies. Now they don't do that. Now they invent newer version, newer, worse versions of characters to fill sure, the, that sure. same role. No, but, uh, it, and, and yeah. that's fair. And that's something I, I, once again, I needed you guys to fill me in on because I mean, Kenny Baker in the R2-D2 thing, like, you know, he's great. Like, R2-D2 is a famous character, you know? Don't get me wrong. Like, everybody knows R2-D2, that type of thing. I thought he was kind of useless in this movie. Not useless in the sense of, maybe irrelevant is a better term. Um, Probably. It was great when they sat there and put two little rocket boosters on the side of Kenny Rob- Kenny Kenny Rogers. <laughs> Kenny Baker's <laughs> costume and had him fly around the smelting plant. Dude, I'm Kenny Rogers of- and this is Jackass. That- no, but <laughs> <laughs> but um uh but you know, I think Kenny Baker was in R2 for about five minutes in episode one and that, that and maybe a day on episode okay. three and, and that okay. was about it. Yeah, but um, but but you know, but you know, I think he has. I think the character of R two D two has more to do in this movie than than in Episode three. Like, 
you know, like as as crazy as the droid factory scene is, there, there's something even slightly more absurd about when he like generates an oil slick to like burn some other droids alive at the beginning of episode three. Please don't like, get that's please almost. Don't, please worse. don't inform Rob of this or make. Uh, no, I actually it. remember. I remember that scene where R two D two like lights something on fire, and um, I, if it's if it's anything like the um the manufacturing line scene in this movie on um a bug planet or torture planet, whatever the hell that planet's called. Um, if it's anything like that, it is boring through and through the entire bit of Padme, like, Oh, oops, oops. I fell into a bowl. I can't get out of it. Like, what, what is that? What is that? It's the equivalent of like me watching the, um, the whole scene where Anakin Padme C-3PO R2D2 are like traversing the, um, the the bug planet you know manufacturing line it's the equivalent of like what if i like picked up a mouse from outdoors and whipped it at an obstacle course that it doesn't understand is that interesting maybe for a little bit because it's kind of fun that you have god powers over these things but after like 10 seconds you're just like i don't care what this thing does like the mouse you know how many you know how many shots you guys have to know there's like 18 individual shots of Natalie Portman in a big weird bowl shaped container, like pawing at the at the at the side of it, going, I can't get up. No, I can't get up yet. Okay, cut to three other things. No, I still can't get up. Cut to three other things. Nope, nope. I tried a different side of the yeah. bowl. I and still they, can't climb it. And what they fake is you out. That, that is <laughs> they, so boring. <laughs> they fake you out on the lava, uh, pouring into her little bowl like two, two or three times as I, well. I it's think I good. missed the fake out of lava because I was vomiting through my eyes at that point. <laughs> that it was so stupid, you know. Oh I mean, I mean that the fake out to... of the lava comes after the fact where C three PO says something like, you know, machines making machines. Now I've seen everything, and I'm just like, you've been on. Oh, Oh my god, this movie is so <laughs> He stupid. says machines making machines, how perverse. And how I really perverse. started laughing. I started oh laughing god. at that. I R2 found that funny. Why'd you hit me? I almost fell over. And I'm like, is this like some like two stooges? It's not three stooges, it's two stooges, because it's one third less funny. Okay, you know? I, have, I, have to, I okay, I, enough of Rob, I have to, enough of this. Please, um, please, guys, please. Okay, this movie, okay, this movie is kind of incredible, because I know the last, okay, there's an episode of Knights of Vader recorded that we weren't able to release, because uh, it became a te- technical catastrophe. Um, but Was in I involved episode- for that one? No, you were okay, not involved with that. You were supposed to, but you it wasn't weren't. My fault. Oh, it was that night. Oh, it was the first night we were supposed to do this episode. Okay. Yes. 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 The yes, first attempt right. at this. Yeah. I have many. And in a discussion, the question is posed to Zanger, I believe, which film is more of the nonsense film, Attack of the Clones or The Rise of Skywalker? And Zanger is like having the ultimate Sophie's choice of like, oh God, like. <laughs> And after, I guess it is the probably the only true fan of The Rise of Skywalker out there, like unironically after watching this i have to say this is easily the more normal film of the two like this is a very streamlined film at no point is it ever like oh god like doing the hyper pacing that jj abrams dan does and then when it goes from like 120 to like 60 you feel like it's go it's moving nowhere at every point of this movie i was engaged there were even some like again i am a sadist i love my trashy dialogue so like yes Anakin sitting there like weirdly just like gawking at Padme. He starts like rubbing her skin. Like it is, it's it's cringe inducing. Like it's delightfully cringe inducing. Um, but even like the music cue of like you have like the across the stars love theme playing as they like kiss for the first time, oh, and then this yes. abruptly stops. Yes, she's like, I shouldn't yes. have done that. I, and I, I'm like, I did love that where she pulls away from the kiss and the music like. <laughs> no, we can't do this, Anakin. And I'm like, ooh, I'm like, oh, okay, is this a Mr. Show sketch from the 90s? You know, that type of thing. No, but Zach, I actually want to, I actually really like that point you just made. As this, the um, the Knights of Vader audience knows, the Kavodians, I don't know what we're calling them. That sounds too much like Kavorkian. We, we might not want that. Um, But I have said on record to you before, Zach, that I think the Rise of Skywalker is a car on square wheels. When you get it going fast enough, it moves, but it's bumpy. This movie, Attack of the Clones, is not like that. It's a it's a real car. It's a real vehicle, but it's going through the most 
boring, scenic Amish route you could find. And that's the comparison that I think is, is worthwhile, is that, yes, I agree with you, Knights of, uh, sorry, Rise of Skywalker is way more stranger because it's a car on square wheels that's giving you so many bumps. This is a regular car going through a boring vista. That's that's my comparison. What's, but what is but what is what is boring about this? There's no, always nothing, something happening. Literally nothing engaged me in this movie. Nothing. We literally get to see not Boba Fett, the OG not Boba Fett, and we see him doing his shtick. And like I don't know, even the the nightclub sequence. Like I'm surprised, Rob, you did not talk about Elano Slees Bagano. Well, I didn't want to bring it up because I knew you were going to bring it up. I mean, we have to talk about uh, what Matt Darman is the actor that plays Elon. Mouse, Mouse from the Matrix, and Mouse from the Matrix. Absolutely, that's one of my notes. Yes, but Matt, the whole Matt point, Doran, Matt Doran. Sorry, but the whole thing is that, like, think about, it. like, we all laugh about how, like, in Disney contemporary Star Wars, there's the obligatory like bar can- cantina moment. Did anybody in 2002 be like, man, like, I hate it when they just do this rinse lather repeat thing like the idea of having like a star wars nightclub that does not feel like a bar and it's j- and it's just there is you're, like you're not wrong in that respect and and that's something i wanted to pose to you guys like i said me watching this independently i did not watch it with other co-hosts i didn't watch it with anybody else it was me just like throwing it on that type of thing and i had to watch it in installments i had to watch it because i got so physically tired while watching this movie like i watched 40 minutes and it got to the point where like obi-wan like popped up to the wet planet and i was like i need to pause it and take a nap type of thing you know and then i watched another 40 minutes and then i paused it and i watched another 40 minutes and there were still 18 minutes left after that point and i was like oh you know that type of thing that is me do you guys think that it's me Growing out of Star Wars, because I think I've expressed that to you guys, not only in this episode, but in in previous episodes or previous discussions of ours, off mic, on mic, anything like that. I liked Star Wars when I was a kid. Now when I watch it, now, it's now so it has a, different. Now Rob has a gun to his head when he thinks about Star well, Wars. Well, yes, that, that is a part of it, Zach, which I want you to comment more. But now it's like I like movies that are so different from Star Wars and the serials that Star Wars is inspired by that I cannot, I cannot get engaged by them anymore. That might be something that's indicative of how the culture has shifted. Well, um, well I, I, I think it's part of culture, but I, I really want, maybe this is better for Zach. I mean, Chris, you've known me for a long time as well. Chris has gotten very many a, a they met together voice messages on Facebook. Iraq you know? and freedom. My, exactly. My, my, one of my standards is, is if you know me, well enough you've gotten late night incoherent rob voice messages on facebook and chris has received those of course you know and so chris can attest to this but it's like now like star wars is so dense i mean there's a line in this movie where they say something like after four trials at the supreme court newt gunray is still the chairman of the trade federation <laughs> and i'm sitting here yes. going yes what? What am I watching right now? In, in the like, whole we're time, five minutes into this movie, in the whole time I hear the the Barney Simpsons gag of just hook it up to my veins. And I want more listen, of that. And then, and then well, you get that and line you, serves a purpose though, because it like, does. No, no, I'm, I'm not saying it doesn't, but I'm just using that as an example of like that's how dense Star Wars movies are. And then I come back where I'm like Zach. I watched Rooney Mara eat a whole pie for 40 minutes. It's the best movie I've seen in 10 years. And Zach is like, where did you go wrong, Rob? Like, I knew you as one person in high school 10 years ago, and now you're telling me that you want to watch Rooney Mara eat a pie while Casey Affleck looks in the distance in a in a cheat with eyes cut out, you know? And that's your favorite movie in the last 10 years. Like, like what is what is the difference between you and I? Maybe that's the better thing is because what what is the difference between someone like me who I feel grew out of Star Wars with somebody like you guys who will pay attention to the Disney shareholder meetings to understand Star Wars better? That has to be the two ends of the spectrum, right? No, I think I think it's the ultimate thesis of this podcast, Rob. Like what are our two f- inaugural episodes? Um why are you putting me on the spot like this zach batman v superman of course is our first one and 
is the second the second one is not Fantastic Planet. Is it, it Fantastic, is Fantastic Planet? Planet? Is it Fantastic Planet? Yes, Breath was not Breathless. It's um oh god, what's his name? Frank Endless. Ocean. Endless. Frank Ocean. Yes. The that's point Arthur. being okay. in the but, fourth but episode you, in the fourth I, episode of the Clone Wars. You're right. You're right. I remember in our discussion of Fantastic Planet, you go, George Lucas had to see this and get some inspiration from it with the bureaucracy that goes on in that movie. Absolutely. Yes, and that's the point. This is the point of Cinemodies. For for those at home, I have to forget this is a, a Knights of Vader episode as well. The point being is that Rob believes Inland Empire is the strangest film ever made. I think Batman v Superman movie. Dawn of Justice is the strangest film ever made. <laughs> because as we joked earlier in this, I have no idea if he'll make the recording or not. It's the notion of there is like three dozen financiers for inland empire yes, yes batman v superman somebody wrote hack snyder a check for like a quarter of a billion dollars and said do what you want we don't care yeah that that is the those are the two sides of the spectrum of cinema the fact that you have one guy with a crazy vision that has to piecemeal it from like countless places and the other side where one entity just says here is all the money in the world just uh, do what david you want. lynch don't don't shortchange inland empire david lynch piecemealing the financing Financing for that movie when it shot all on digital, which should exactly. not need it money. Like a, it Absolutely. looks like a home movie. Um, yes, and of course, everybody, please uh, tune in to our eventual episode on Inland Empire or Rabbits. I think we'll get to one of them first, of course. Um, Rabbits shot on, you know, 35 millimeter, which is a short film within Inland Empire shot on digital. Um, bring this back I, to Attack I just, of the want, I just want Naomi Watts to read me poetry in a bunny costume. Is that too much to ask? Chris, is that too much to ask? I, if people knew how to print money, that's what you would have. All the time. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we love Chris on this podcast. But Zach, please continue with the um the, the point. The, the, the thing notion. with Attack of the Clones, that like over time, that like when we recorded that episode back in 2017, we had Josh on the the true inspiration of me podcasting from unex- uh, uncovering unexplained mysteries. Sure, him being our normie at the time. It was the notion of Attack of the Clones was always the like, oh God, redheaded bastard stepchild of Star Wars. Okay. It was this film that nobody understood. Everybody used to always just use that as a punching bag. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then sequel trilogy came along with The Last Jedi and Rise of Skywalker. And Attack of the Clones all of a sudden became like, yeah, this is okay. Um, Attack of the Clones, again, like Rob said, I think Rob put it like beautifully. It's the idea of it's a car that runs fine. It's like a Toyota Camry going for a drive on more or less flat roads. It's reliable, like, but it's taking you through the the not the optimal route, according to Google. You know? As I see it, it's a trip through the Everglades. You might see a Sasquatch or two or a crocodile, but for the most part, you're not going to see something that you haven't already seen before. And the chances Zach, of I, would, really I being- would like to correct you, and uh, it is pronounced the Everglades, if you don't remember that. Um, sorry, but uh, it's the Everglades. Technically, it's the Thank Glads. You. It's the Glads, Rob. The like, Glads? You know, did, did I mess up our own joke from 12 yes. years ago? Yes, okay. the Glads on A and E. Welcome to this Tuesdays podcast. From 11 to 10. I, I actually, with now what we said, I think Zach, you you chimed in and you've uh, replied like to a, my Rob, thoughts. Rob, we're the only people on the on the face of this earth that will get that joke, and that's the only reason we're podcasting <laughs> together, Zach. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so clearly, Zach has responded to me. I've made my point clear. I think we're missing Chris's thoughts on this movie, which Zach, you might know from Knights of Vader, but I don't. So so Chris, I mean. You know, what do you, what do you have to think about Attack of the Clones? And also, what do you have to think about the fact that um, we are in Zencaster right now? And if everybody looks up to the URL in their browser, it says, you know, Zencaster.com slash Cinemodities underscore Attack of the Most Boringest Movie Ever, which is what I called this recording. <laughs> yeah, I'm, it's, I think there's definitely something to do with your state of mind while watching it that sort of flavored that impression okay because if you just write a bullet point list of the like story moments that happen in this movie it's just it's crazy like it there's no way it's real but yet there it is so i i don't know how you could find it that boring like like it's it's uh it, it's literally like five like five crazy environments not just visually but contextually stuff that doesn't exist sure sure the the boring stuff is the sort of basic character interactions between anakin and padme that's that that tends to draw out a little bit but you know when you compare this it's so it has such 
a more logical progression. Like, it's really true that we didn't know how good we had it. Like, you know, like, like they, they spend maybe 35 minutes setting up why the clone army exists in this movie before it uh, explodes onto the scene at the end, you know, in, in the rise of Skywalker, there's two gigantic armies that just appear out of nowhere that have a big battle at the end. Cause more armies are better. I mean, that's, that's just a fact of, of yeah. the universe, right? Yeah. But, but I, it's just, there's like you were saying, it's so dense with information about the, the way the galaxy functions. Like, I don't know if you guys, are, I'm sure Rob, I'm sure you didn't think about this, but just because it's, why would you? But I always like watching it back. It's just those little details stand out that are so insightful. Like, like, um, Zach, help me out. Uh, Prime Minister of Camino's name. Uh, uh, no, Sifo Diaz. Lamasu. Lamasu. Yeah, right? it's Tom yeah. Lee. Okay. You have Lamasu, so, who dies during right. the bad batch. Right. So Lamasu says that uh, 200,000 units are ready and there's a million more well on the way, which the, the sort of gives you... you guys just agreed on does not get stated in the movie, right? Yeah, it does. Yeah. No, it does not. No, it, yeah, it does. does not. Yeah, Tom Lee says his name. He introduces our Who is that? <laughs> <laughs> you, you, yeah, I basically said that name never gets said in the movie, and you go blah 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 says blah blah blah. You're like that's what you yeah. just said to me. Saying. Well, no, they all right. Do not, so okay, okay. So, so Rob, there's just, a moment where Hayden Christensen says, "Oh my God." <laughs> You and McGregor would be very angry with me that my lightsaber got chopped in half. That's the I that's just... the only moment in the movie I remember any names get said. Okay, all right. That's All what right. There are numerous so... moments in the movie where Anakin says, "Insert blank here." Obi Wan's not going to be happy. <laughs> oh, not Anakin again. It's a pair with the Force, and he's like, the "Obi Wan's going to kill me." The only line of dialogue I have written down that does not involve characters' names is from the beginning of the movie when Jar Jar Binks says, "Misa." with happiness to see you again annie <laughs> all right and if so, i have not heard a better pickup line for someone <laughs> named annie like if you're meeting a girl named annie you go misa busting with happiness to see you again annie dude talk about you better you better bust out the uh prophylactics you're getting lucky tonight <laughs> do i have to bleep that out I think that I, think I tried, tried to make that as family friendly as possible. Is, is prophylactic something that has to be edited no, out? No. It, it, uh, Misa, five years ago, no. Today, maybe. Me supposed um. with happiness if you don't leave that out, Zach. <laughs> All right. So what I was trying to get to was the idea that uh, Lama Su, Prime Minister of Kamino, as introduced by Tantwi to Obi-Wan on screen, says on that there's... Yeah, says that there's two hundred thousand clones ready and a million more. I can speak well Spanish too, if you guys want me to. I mean, which, come on. which, what? The interesting thing I find out find about that is it's sort of that one line sort of gives you like a relative scale for the 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 Clone Wars in a sense. And the 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 interesting thing is that means there's basically in during the Clone Wars there was actually less clones than there are uh, enlisted members of the U.S. Army. <laughs> oh interesting okay <laughs> across the whole galaxy the entire clone wars that's i don't know that's that's interesting to me it's just, it's just like if there's a million more on the way they're probably that's probably covers the next three years i i do want to say on that topic you know um i did for the cinema audience of course and the knights of vader audience which we i don't think i had a name for other than the cov audience maybe which like we said galaxy warriors like, galaxy, galaxy warriors. warriors good cov audience sounds like too much fans of dr kevorkian or something like that you know um i gave this movie a whopping one star out of five on letterboxd uh my review Ooh. for it was just the Ooh. phrase the cure for insomnia uh because i literally had difficulty staying awake for it there's uh what when i give something half a star it's like there's no redeeming qualities about it i gave this one star because there are some cool ideas and i have to say the idea of this planet just specializing in creating clone armies is really cool that's a neat sci-fi idea that i wish wasn't just like swept under the rug of okay you get it go away now type of thing in this movie I mean, it gets a good amount of real estate and there's there was there was basically um like last year there was like an like 
an entire animated show that was pretty much just like about the clone planet. It was pretty extreme. Don't, it was like, don't I know you're not going to watch that me about how many hours. See, Chris is Chris is saying to me what I've been saying to you, Zach, for the last 10 years that you have to catch up on the collective 65 seasons of law and order to understand no, why this season of not law even, and order is no, fun, no, it's not know? to understand it. I'm not, it's not to understand it, but you know how you were just saying that the planet Camino is kind of interesting and like what they do there is kind of interesting. I didn't say the planet's name, but I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so like <laughs> the so water like, planet. So like literally like last year, like, you know, 20 years after this movie came out, okay. they did like 12 episodes of a series that were, is pretty much just, Tom Foolery on Camino, <laughs> ending, Tom with, ending on Camino. A- I ending hope that's the name of the series. Yeah. <laughs> ending with ending with star destroyers flying in and shooting the cities to nothing. <laughs> Zach, I'm thinking with with Chris saying that, you know, sung to the tune of Too Many Cooks. Tom Foolery, Tom Foolery on Camino. You know that type of thing. <laughs> What I'm saying is Camino was a it made a lasting cultural impression that is being capitalized on to this day. I also want to mention um apparently it's called Camino. I did not know that from watching this movie. I I get maybe this is a better uh way than other well, to Dexter say. Jester says that it's called Camino. He does, he does, and that's what I'm getting at is that uh I I I think Zach hit on it before. Chris probably you did as well. Uh I I'm going to just pull the curtain back. Um after about 40 minutes into this movie, I did not watch it attentively. You know, I uh, was checking some emails. Boo! Uh, Boo! We live, we live in North America. I got the notification that I could order more free COVID tests or USPS. I did that. You know, <laughs> I, uh, I checked some of my business email. I, I, I tried my hardest to keep myself awake during this movie because the moments I, I was watching it attentively, it was the cure for insomnia. But, okay, okay. Chris, you know, you said Camino. That's the clone planet, whatever, the wet planet, whatever. Sure. I do want to say, getting back on topic, I love the look of those long neck aliens. I really do like the look of those aliens. And that goes to what I was saying about how this movie does not look as bad as I think people say it is. I really like the look of those like what like double the height of you and mcgregor of our jedi when we see them i think there's some great shots when you and mcgregor you know very stupidly it's a it's a dumb line of dialogue what one of the aliens goes we are ready to show you our troops and you and mcgregor goes oh i don't know what i'm acting against where do i look uh but that's why i'm here okay where's yeah, the tennis well, ball that i'm looking at you know yeah. it is uh, atrocious in terms of actual physical acting they um, they give him a tour of the whole place, should, yes. giving away all their trade secrets, and there's a lot without of even verifying shots. his ID. There's a lot of background shots where you get to see, like you know, the clones going up against these tall Kaminoans. I'm assuming that's the way to talk about them, because Cl- close enough. Okay, thank, thank you. I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be a, a good host here. Um, but it's like you see them being so different from the clones they're creating. You see the shots of like the all the little kids like doing training motions. You see like the adults going through the marching orders. And I'm like, this is a neat idea. And not only is this a neat idea to me now, but this is the thing I watch and I go, I get why I love this so much when I was a kid. Like this shaped my love of sci-fi and fantastical stories. Even though I don't really like Star Wars now, this is what shaped me into becoming somebody who loves these weird kind of out of the box, like somebody finds a weird planet and they're making clones. And I'm just like, that's the coolest thing to me, you know? And I, so I have to give respect to this movie for making me the man I am today, which I also have to say, um, you know, I have a, a clear apprehension for my nostalgia because it did make me the man I am today. And uh, who would want to be that? <laughs> What did you? How did you feel about Christopher Lee in this movie while you're what, oh, of what you my saw of it? Rob? Favorite part about this movie seeing Christopher Lee. I mean, Christopher Lee is the one part of this movie where he's like giving it his all, like he's doing the full like Broadway performance, like theatrical performance. Every time he talks to Ewan McGregor, like the first scene when he walks in on Ewan McGregor, like who's in like stupid light handcuffs, whatever the hell that is going on. He's floating and he can't get out. 
Christopher Lee says something like, I'm sorry, my friend. This has gone too far. They were not supposed to restrain you. I'll see you release. And then they have this whole back and forth monologue. Christopher Lee is giving it like his all. Like Christopher Lee is not pulling any punches. You know, he's as good of an, of an actor that he's ever been. And then at the end of the scene, he's like, securing your release might not be as easy as I expected. And I'm like, Christopher Lee, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you're going to get like get away at the end of this movie and now you're going to get your head cut off at the start of the third movie. I remember that. But I'm like, Christopher Lee, I'm like, kill Yoda. Beat the shit out of that little green dude, you know? I'm sorry, Zach. I'm sorry, Zach, but I had to say it. I'm like, I'm so on board with Christopher Lee in this movie. All right. Well, what, uh, and I was going to ask Zach about this too, but like what, um, like, I don't know if you were paying enough attention to like, to like have an opinion on this, but like, what do you think the deal is with, uh, with Christopher Lee trying to, uh, tell, tell Obi-Wan about Sidious, Sidious controlling the Senate? Like, what do you think's going on there? Okay. I I just want to say right now, maybe this will be edited out. I have no thoughts on this. This is Star Wars lore. While you guys talk about it, I have to take a quick bathroom break. So please, you guys talk about it. I'll take a bathroom God break. Damn it. And I'm very please, please, Chris. Yeah. Last time I took a bathroom break in Urban Legend, it cut me from the recording, if you remember. Yeah. Yeah. Hope that doesn't happen again, but we'll see how it goes. Okay. All right. All right, Chris. All, all right, Zach. What, Zach, what, talk, t- talk me about the Christopher Lee, Christopher Lee Obi Wan scene. The Christopher Lee thing is kind of interesting. Because um, the whole thing is that, like, obviously he's there stunt casting because it's fun to see Christopher Lee Dracula is like a Sith Lord. I remember as a kid watching this for the first time and not really knowing, like, what again, I knew Count Dooku was the bad guy based on the toys and the red lightsaber. But I didn't really, it was kind of like, what are his motives? Like, clearly he's a bad guy, though, but there was something grander in mind. Like, as a kid watching this, like, of course, you see the Death Star, all of this, and Palpatine and him are sitting there conspiring. But I, I guess unless you really were, like, in the mindset that we are in contemporary Star Wars, where all this is is, like, a giant just cork board with yarn being attached to different, like, push pins, um, it's pretty ambiguous. Like, at the time, it was like, okay, like, wh- where is this leading towards? I think about this is before both Clone Wars series – so it was kind of the idea of like I remember a lot of speculation, like what minimal amount of interaction I had like on I don't even know if it would be message boards, just of like what would episode three be? Like other than just lava Anakin in the suit, it was like where where does this pick up? And for the most part, it, it feels now like obviously Lucas like winking at the audience. But then it it really did allude to like a larger conspiracy than what we were kind of expecting. Yeah, well, it's just it, it like it always like stands out to me when I watch this just because on some level um it's like the like looking at episode 3 looking at it like retrospectively with the information of episode 3, it seems kind of obvious what the intention was, but then you think episode 3 started out as a very different movie than what it became, right? So it's you know, on some level you could it's like he's just trying to cause create create more separation between the jedi and the and the senate make them make the jedi suspicious of the senate because he like as if he knew obi-wan wasn't gonna join him at that time and destroy the sith he 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 knew that was he, he could read him that that wasn't gonna work so you could say he's just trying to get the jedi suspicious of the senate which I guess is reinforced by the line at the end of the movie where he's like, where they're, they're sitting in the council chambers and they're like, we should probably watch the Senate a little more closely. So I guess that's would be the direct connection. They're talking about that revelation there, but um, I don't know if the moment of Mace, like Mace Windu and the other Jedi, like coming into arrest Palpatine was in Lucas's mind at the time. I, it's hard to say, you know, well, it's, it's again. We'll never know the specifics of when Lucas thought of these moments and when everything. Like, like you would love to know that final draft of the script where he was like, "Aha!" Like I nailed right. it. Um, we'll, we'll never know that definitive moment where Lucas is, was content with his vision. There's think- well, there's fun little insights though, because like I'm you might know like on the commentary for Attack of the Clones, Lucas says 
you're going to find out who ordered the clone army in episode three. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> At the time he committed that to the commentary. He's like, you're going to, it's in episode three, but I just wanted to plant the seed. Well, that's the thing. It's because again, this goes back to obviously Zenger's favorite plot point of all time, a uh, Sifo D Sidious and the mispronunciation that launched an entire character. It, it, it's the idea that I think Dooku has always been shortchanged of a char- as a character is because he's just, he's Christopher Lee. Like, he, he's a villain. Like, there's really no, the same way that Grievous outside of comics is not a character. Um, Maul's the only exception because Cowboy Hat Man decided to, like, puff him, like, kind of, like, buff him. Are you saying, Zach, that, like, Christopher Lee brings a presence to that role that, you know, is almost, um, I I would say, undeserving of Star Wars, but brings a role that, you know, he's so menacing that he brings that villainousness to just with ambiance? I don't think it's ambiance. I think it's just you see how Christopher Lee is, like, made up as Count Dooku. His name is literally Count. Yeah. Like, like, that tells you all you need to know. Don't they Um, say that in Revenge of the Sith? Like, my powers have doubled since we faced last time Count. Doesn't Anakin say that? That's Revenge of the Sith, yeah. Revenge of the Sith, yeah. But, like, think about one of the first lines of dialogue in this is them, uh, Padme in the, what, loyalty committee walking into Palpatine's office being like, I believe it was Count Dooku who was behind this. (laughs) <laughs> and that's really how it's just thrown out. And it's like, like again, as a kid watching this in 2002, you're like, what? <laughs> like the guy with the green and red lightsabers? Like, <laughs> it, 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 it's like in the packaging, it's like, it makes no sense. It's like, what does this all mean? And because again, Rob, even there's what is there, uh, disgruntled spice miners on the moons of Naboo? Like, I'm surprised that's not your favorite line of dialogue. Something in this like movie. that. No, one of my, one of my favorite lines is my first note about this where, um, I, I had a hearty belly laugh while watching this movie at the start. It was not indicative of my feelings for the rest of the movie. When, um you know, the the aircraft, spacecraft lands on Coruscant and it lands fine. And what one of Princess Amidala guards goes like, I guess we were wrong. There was no danger at all. Cue gigantic explosion multiple bodies flying away and i'm like okay like is i hope this is what we're in for for the rest of the time uh but unfortunately we are not (laughs) comedic timing is not a forte of uh this movie i would say (laughs) well i think but again i again this is why i think people don't understand about just cinema when they complain again i get it most moviegoers aren't supposed to consume this stuff like on a critical level again it's like going into a mcdonald's and rating the uh, the quality of the pickles sure. and the brine they used it's it's not meant to be devoured that sort of way that and that's I think- where i want you guys to talk more about this because i'm a i'm a filthy casual i'm a plebeian you know i'm looking at this in this in the expanse of and zach knows this like i'm coming off 16 different straight to DVD Sydney Sweeney movies, you know, like I'm not ready to rank a star Wars film like you guys are. So I'm the filthy casual, but Zach, I think the point you're trying to make is that there, there should be some level of, you know, understanding to what a star Wars star Wars film is when ranking this movie. Can it be ranked independently? Like, like I did on letterbox or, or should it, be put in the frame of other star wars type of thing um that's the thing like objectively speaking it's hard to again like like i can't be objective about this film like watching it for this recording i tried really really hard to put my like critical thinking cap on and to kind of remove myself from the nostalgia and I was able to, but I was enthralled. Like, I think I'm just predisposed to enjoy this. Sure. Um, it's just my taste. It's like telling somebody who loves ice cream, we want you to rate, like, rate chocolate ice cream exactly. without thinking about your history of it. It's it's exactly. almost impossible. You cannot, again, again, Rob, consider you're probably the, oh God, the only living person that's known me consistently is, think about that, Rob, oldest living person that's consistently don't, known me for a decade don't plus. Don't start to talk about you, me, and your dad throwing dry ice in a cooler, okay? That's a story <laughs> for another time. No, but, but I, point, I think you're getting at, at a great though, point. Is that I don't know there. if you can separate the Star Wars from the Zachary. Exactly, is that, you know, when, when you get so interested in something, whether it be Zach with Star Wars, whether it be me with, you know, kind of my foreign animation uh, 
tilt that we're going we have gone on in cinemodities. Um, there's certain things that we spend so much clout or time into that it's like we can't get an objective response. It's almost like we are the living embodiment of response bias, is that we want to talk about these things because we feel so strongly about them. And that is one of the things that I don't feel that way about Star Wars. I feel so neutral about Star Wars that I want to get that statistical backing about it, which is why I love when Zach brought me on for that horrible, horrible snowball effect study that we did, you know, what, a year, year and a half ago or whatever. But I would love to get more data about that. It's the same thing with Harry Potter fans. Like, you know, if you're going to take a ranking about what are the best Harry Potter films, you better leave my mom out of it. Because my mom is going to hack the system to make sure every movie gets every top ranking, that type of thing. But that's the thing. How do we measure things that are so loved by a subset in an objective way? Because the only people who are speaking and reacting to surveys about these things are the people that feel strongly about them. It's, it's, it's literally the response bias for Star Wars for Harry Potter, for everything else, that type of thing. As I'm saying this, Zach is literally showing me the crotch of Boba Fett. Is that Boba Fett? Whoa, I'm sorry. whoa. I'm sorry, Zach. Did don't, you just don't say Boba don't, Fett? No, don't. Do not get angry at me for not knowing your out-of-focus action figure. Okay, please don't get All right, all right, is it, all right. In real time, everybody. Is it Django Unchained Fett? <laughs> D is silent. All right, Rob. We're gonna do this. We have, to do, we have to do the Pepsi challenge right now, Rob. Which one is Boba Fett and which okay. one is Django Fett? Okay. So I don't know if if you your holding it up is switched from my viewing. So let Rob let just give me the that. goddamn color. The the greener one on the right to me. Stage right. Hold it up. Yes, that's Boba Fett. That's. Django Unchained. <laughs> okay, that's Django Unchained. <laughs> you know I can't take any challenge seriously, Zach. But no, I mean, I think this this gets at a big idea of what I, why I want to talk to you guys so much about this movie and about Star Wars is that, like, Star Wars is so culturally imperative. You, I think we can all agree about that, right? It's like... It's like, even if you are not a gigantic fan, whether it be Zach or Chris, as I'm looking at their cameras right now with many action figures and starships hanging from their wall, hanging from their ceiling, all that stuff. I mean, Chris, if I'm pretty sure, if I remember correctly, if you tilted your camera a little bit, you would get like an arcade cabinet of a Starfighter game. That type of thing? It, yeah, it's in a different room. But yeah, oh, here, yeah. oh, oh, excuse me. Okay. But, like, you have to you have to separate that, that love from somebody like me who respects Star Wars. And I think that there is a great level to the cultural resonance of Star Wars between those two statuses, between these people who, like, care so much that they will argue it down to the nitty-gritty versus someone like me who is... Yeah, I will correct somebody. Like, if I'm in a regular conversation with somebody and they go like, yeah, you know, you know, episode two when Mace, Mace Windu, Samuel Jackson, he cuts off the head of Boba Fett. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there to be the one like, it's not Boba Fett. It's Django Fett. And they're probably going to look at me with a frown for the rest of their life, that type of thing. But I think yeah, there Bo is something... Boba Fett watches on in horror while it's happening. Absolutely, yeah. which is... an. A truly grotesque scene in, in Attack of the Clones. But I think there is a level of, like, understanding culturally. And I think that's the point I'm trying to make, and the point I want to make with this discussion, is that Star Wars has reached something that no other intellectual property has ever in the history of humanity. Everybody across the world knows it. To different levels, if that makes sense. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, for, for me personally, it's like 70% of the enjoyment is like the cultural resonance and the other 30% is like the actual content. It's it's uh like, for example, like I basically don't like almost everything Disney has put out, yet I still really enjoy Star Wars. Sure, sure. It's crazy, right? I mean, Disney yeah. is... um. 
Like, I, I will I will not say what I was about to say because this has to be edited for Knights of Vader, so I will refrain from that for sure. Um. <laughs> well, yeah, but okay, like, the... I'm I'm, I'm going to go to a convention for a week, a Star Wars convention for a week, after saying I don't like pretty much anything Disney and, has and put out. And that's the beauty of it. And I want to I want to reiterate this. Maybe the better example of of me not using very um you know slur based uh you know tact that I was about to use um. I think the same thing goes what, that Zach can acknowledge, and Chris, I don't know if you're aware of this, um, but I, I, my big fanboy thing is Adventure Time. I follow everything that has ever been published. I follow everybody's Tumblr from the art team. I follow everybody's like storyboards, like you know everything. Like there is no corner of Adventure Time that Ben and I have not talked about that type of thing, and that's my Star Wars to you guys, you know, and. I understand if people are like, yeah, Adventure Time, it's fun. You know, that type of thing. And I want to say to them, no, you don't understand. There's so much detail. There's all these iterations. There's the fact that, you know, this one this one panel of a storyboard got reused, you know, two seasons later. And that matters and stuff like that. That is where I ha- I actually have to say I have the understanding for you guys. Because I care more about Adventure Time than anything else in the world. I... um my uh my Colorado Department of Revenue job should never hear this because they would probably fire me for me saying that, you know, this type of thing. But I There's care another about it so much you. as you care about <laughs> Star Wars, that type of thing. And and I respect that. And it's 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 the same thing. And I want to reiterate this idea because it's like, you know, I say to Zach, I'm like, oh Zach, you know, you hit me up and you want to do like this this uh goofy fun, you know, um trivia night on knights of vader we're gonna do a trivia episode that type of thing and you know that that whole idea that chris and i have talked about and zach's like yeah you know maybe we have to talk about this type of thing and i'm like oh maybe i i'd ask a trivia question about the lava planet duel and zach goes rob you're banned you're banned from talking to me again the lava planet duel is a stupid way to say it you know that type of thing and i'm like no the one on the on the lava planet he's like there's multiple ones on the lava planet you know that type of thing if you guys came at me with that same ignorance about Adventure Time, I'd be just as angry. That's what I'm saying, is that everybody has their field of expertise, and the way that we get to focus on it is beautiful in terms of the human species. May I get that grandiose in this episode? Thank you. <laughs> I just wish there was some whoever the crazy person responsible for adventure time was i wish they pendleton had the ward is the creator uh, of adventure time pendleton if you also want to talk about adam muto the showrunner for many seasons right. if you want to talk about uh, rebecca yeah. sugar who wrote most of the songs for adventure time chris chris is literally going oh my god why did i say this to Rob? no i just mean <laughs> i i just mean i wish that guy would have had the luxury of spending 115 million dollars on two hours of adventure time 20 years ago and not caring when anyone else thought about it and releasing it in theaters because that's what that attack of the clones is it's just chaos here's the thing i don't wish that i think restraint is one of the best well here maybe chris this is something i don't think you and i ever talked about but this is something i truly fundamentally believe in the number one thing that creates great art is misery when people are sad, when people have really deep, deep introspective and extra extrospective problems, that creates great art. The well, other I thing mean, that creates great art is singularity. <laughs> There's this wonderful. Uh, maybe this speaks to that a little bit. There's this wonderful scene in the uh, in, in the episode one uh, behind the scenes where they it's an internal screening with Lucas and Rick McCallum and a bunch of the other sort of high ups okay. at Lucasfilm, and they just watched episode one, and Rick McCallum just like he just like puts his face his hands in his face and he's just like <laughs> oh yeah the look like on his face earlier yeah okay yeah, yeah the look yeah. on his face is that <laughs> we are screwed <laughs> like like what did we just do <laughs> and uh that's i mean that's not how it played out financially like i don't know it's definitely like you like it's like there's this this cultural meme that the, those three movies are like s- somehow like less than or not worthy yet they're they're the source material for properties that are coming out today like all the time i can talk be to you a- guys for hours about the cultural meme impact of the trilogy sequel of the prequel 
trilogy. What it, I don't know what to call it. You know, episode one, two, and three. I guess I I have so much to say about that, but it's like. Is it worth even talking about because there's so much more worth talking about because of what the prequel trilogy has inspired in our culture, right? Yeah, it's like it's the idea that those movies weren't so good yet. Let's um, let's make make a sequel to them. The only thing anyone cares about on Disney Plus starting like this week. You know what I mean? Like, let's get Hayden Christensen and Ewan McGregor back to follow up those movies that wink no one liked when they came out like even you know up to last week kathleen kennedy makes comments about how like they weren't super well received at the time but it it it's 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 just interesting that that's where lucasfilm is at creative not now. not like, even that but the backlog of what i've found because because zach knows this i don't know if chris is aware of this but i i will make it aware to the cinema audience i like to spelunk into the deep dark hives of the internet that Zach, you know what I'm talking about. Make fun of transgender people because they have a feeling, you know? Um, The people who say the Matrix will never be good because the directors were in a different body, that type of thing. That's a whole different discussion, that type of, that whole type of idea. The people who hate for the sake of hating. I like to really do a deep dive into their psyche and their forums. And they are the people who, like, bastardize original feelings through memeology. You know, I, I like to think, this might be the best example, it's like, episode one comes out in 1999, you know, Jar Jar Banks is the laughing stock of the world. Not the internet yet, because the internet really did not exist in 1999. Well, it did, you know, technically it did exist, um, but it was not the powerhouse that it was. But then, as time goes on, People start making fun of Ahmed Best. People start making fun of Jar Jar Banks, that type of thing. People start doing the uh, Misa Horny, you know, that type of thing. There's a lot of uh, adult erotica of revolving around uh, Jar Jar please Banks stop. and stuff please like stop. that. Please stop. No, Zach, you should have stopped me earlier. This is the point I'm trying to make. Oh, and that when it comes down to it, it's Are you like mad people... there's no Kaminoans or Dexter Jetster stuff? Which I'm pretty sure it's there. I don't know what you're saying to me. I, I, you're speaking... I, I'm, I'm learning Spanish right now, Zach. You're speaking <laughs> German. I don't understand what you're saying to me. Um, But no, that's the thing, is that like eventually it becomes a cultural standpoint for people to make fun of. And isn't that just a snowball effect? Is that there were a few people in the right places at the start of the internet to make fun of episode one that led into the snowball effect of making fun of episode two, episode three of Star Wars, of George Lucas. And, you know, I I think it's something that Ben and I talked about with the animation factor because Ben and I talked a lot about the fact of Ghost in the Shell comes out in 1995 that greatly influences the people behind Toonami. Toonami creates the the California role, basically, for, you know, American audiences, that type of thing. Everybody tune into those episodes. Um, I, I don't think that this movie deserves the hate it gets. I think it is more of a cultural hate than an earned hate, if that makes sense. Spoken like someone who truly appreciates the idea of what this movie is, but I, still can't watch it. Well, I, I do appreciate. Exactly. I appreciate Star Wars. I appreciate the love you guys have for it. This movie is literally from the rest from now till the end of time. If I need to go to sleep, if I drink a little too many beers before bed and I'm a little too buzzed and can't fall asleep, you better believe I'm gonna put on any action scene in Attack of the Clones because that is a snooze fest to me <laughs> you don't like seismic charge okay zach zach <laughs> zach okay i do like the seismic charges not only because of the sound they make but because they evacuate sound from the area when right before they're about to blow up um that is really cool i was thinking more of if i need to go to bed i'll put on the um coruscant chase scene I'll put on the um, manufacturing, you know, Natalie Portman is timing how to jump through these barriers type of thing, but she still messes up and ends up in a gold pit, you know, whatever. No, no, no. She doesn't, she doesn't miss time that what happens is a giant flying bug, like pushes her off of like a conveyor belt. Exactly. I, I will okay, put that Rob, on to fall Rob, asleep. I, I will okay, put that on to fall asleep. 
But Rob, this is the thing though. Like, let's distill this movie into pure cinematical terms. Please, please, you guys. The film ask me begins. The please. film begins with like a, a, a spaceship landing on a planet, and one of the characters, like the opening line of dialogue, audibly exclaims, "I'm sure glad nothing bad happened to I didn't us." Think, oh, apparently, we didn't bad. need this security. Nothing bad will happen. <laughs> Boom! Dude, I laughed hysterically at that. Yes, I, okay, I, I, okay. yes, yes. <laughs> then transition that into just, okay, you have Anakin Obi-Wan in the elevator, where you have Anakin, like, sweating through his clothes as he makes all these, like, oh, God, so, like, like, even though we say he's supposed to be 18, 19 years old, and he's supposed to, like, trip over his words, think about it. The whole point of a Jedi is basically to be a trained diplomat. And yet he's sure. talking to this senator and he just cannot like he can't keep like he can't keep it in his pants. Well, I mean, no, Zach, I mean, you're right. But I mean, doesn't all that emotion get undercut by the time that he says, you know, there's multiple cuts to Hayden Christensen in this movie, like close up face cuts where he says, I'm so horny, I'm about to bust. <laughs> Like that that happens in this movie. Like, am I wrong? And did I watch the wrong version of this movie? Like I think literally it's subtext, Obi-Wan right? I think that says, part is subtext. I think you Obi- kind of Obi-Wan says something like, you know, I haven't seen you this nervous since we uh got lost in the uh until we fell into that net. Fell you you were lost in the Balthazar for Zoan Shakespearean temples and, and Anakin goes, But I saved you, Master, and he goes, But you look sweaty, and he goes, I'm so horny, I'm about to bust <laughs> like that happens at least six times in the first 20 minutes. I, I don't know why you're laughing, Zach. That is a moment in the movie. Chris, please. Zach can't talk right now. Corroborate. Hayden Christensen looked me in the eyes in this movie and went, I'm so horny, I'm about to bust. It right? does. I mean, it's a part I mean, of this movie. It, he's very, okay, I will concede. Anakin is very horny in this movie. Like, he so is. horny he's about to bust, absolutely. Okay, there. Okay, to give him give him some do. There is a moment where she dresses like in an S and M outfit in front of like a fire, and she tells him we can't do this. Well, well, and he, wishes he, could, and he wishes he could wish these feelings away. In the 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 scene in front of the fire is the one that literally stood out to me. It, all joking aside, <laughs> that's the one where he's like, you know, if you're if you're feeling pain like I am, please tell me. I don't want to be feeling this, and I'm like. You're talking about a boner. Like a boner <laughs> isn't pain. Like a boner, like like a boner feels like pain when you're 13 years old. And I get he's a Jedi and he's been restricted from this, but that's what he's talking about. He's like, he's like, if you're in as much pain as I am, please oh, tell me because I can't on? stop loving yeah, you. Yeah. I can't stop loving you. I'm about to bust. <laughs> and it's like he's like, please bite this pear. Bite this pear that I sliced for you with the force. <laughs> and i'm like i'm like oh my god calm down are you here to like save your mother and then he's like he's like padme padme i wanna i wanna bone you so hard but 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 my mother is being attacked and assaulted by tuscan raiders those goddamn sand people and i'm like whoa this movie's going off the rails at this point This will be the cinematic's only version part of this conversation. Yeah. Well, um, to to follow up on the last acceptable thing that you said, <laughs> it, it, the okay, there is, okay, turn it back two hours, go for it. Yeah, yeah, there is like if, if there is an interesting contrast if you do watch these movies in uh, chronological order, where at the beginning of episode one you do you you get a like they, we get a little window into the working relationship of the master and Padawan situation with Qui Gon and Obi Wan, and like. We, uh, if you compare these two these two examples, you start to see that Obi Wan is like clearly a way better Jedi than Anakin. Well, like I'm, at the I'm beginning of episode one, up. I want you to continue. Yeah. I don't want to cut you off. I want you to continue, but I yeah. want to bring up this idea that I think in this movie I get where Anakin is coming from about Obi Wan specifically. But please continue. Well, I, I just I just mean that like Obi Wan is like like his is uh Qui Gon's telling him that he needs to keep his mind in the here and now where it belongs. Sure. But like, he's doing that times 10 compared to like what Anakin is capable of doing. Like he's, he's, he's all business at the beginning of episode one. Like they're both acting like adults. It's crazy. Compare that to this. What and is you're, episode you're, you're right. one? Is that the, is that the 
blow up the Death Star movie? What? What are we talking about? Uh, and 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 at the at, well, Rob, at the beginning of episode Zach one, Zach gave a very disapproving <laughs> shake of the head to that joke. I'm it, sorry. Well, it, it is it is one of the <laughs> blow up the Death Star movies. Okay, there is okay. a there is a Star Wars formula that. Uh, <laughs> Unfortunately, there's that a lot of blow up that, Death Star movies. Yeah, there's at least <laughs> half three of, blow up the Death the, Star movies. Half, half yeah. Star Wars films are blow up the Death Star movies, but only one yeah. where Darth Vader is gonna bust a nut, bro. Oh god! Actually, <laughs> actually, there's there's actually no Star Wars movies where Darth Vader where there's a Death Star blowing up as long with busting nuts. <laughs> <laughs> actually, the Venn diagram there provides no overlap. Chris, Chris, I think I know what you're saying. Um, it was 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 there more. Did we cut you off? I'm sorry if not, not, not really. It's just the, it's just uh, like I there ha- I'm just pointing out the fact that like the behavior of the characters okay. in episode one is is a is presented in a way that telegraphs what? that okay. Lucas isn't doing Anakin's behavior by accident. You, you you use the word telegraph, and that's really my question, um, because I have not seen episode one, Phantom Menace. I have not seen a lot of Star Wars movies in a very long time. Um, are you saying that the, the groundwork for Anakin's whininess, which, not what I'm saying, but I've heard a lot of critics say, uh, Hayden Christensen's whininess as Anakin is set up in this second movie. Is that what you're saying? No, I just, I'm just point. I'm just saying that like okay. it, the the way Anakin's acting is not just uh, down to it's not down to Lucas not knowing what he's doing because gotcha because the characters are presented um, in in a more formal uh adult way in episode one like the like the the relationship between liam neeson's character and ewan mcgregor in episode one is presented more intellectually and professionally in their conversations i i I don't know if i would say intellectually i think professionally like as you said is a good word i think academically is another good adjective for it um, yeah for sure um, I have two things to say about that. One, Zach, I just realized I'm very upset. You have replaced your Matrix Resurrections poster in your room with a Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness poster. I did. And, um, I, and I do Kenobi not care. Poster. I do not care how much we love Sam Raimi. That should not have replaced the Matrix Resurrection poster. Um, so you can go suck a big fat dick, Zach. Uh, but let me please continue <laughs> on this point. Um, in the second movie. I understand why Anakin is upset with Obi-Wan. I kind of got that more than I ever did in this last viewing where Anakin, of course, throughout the whole movie, he's complaining to himself, uh, complaining to Amidala, you know, Natalie Portman, that type of thing. Like, Obi-Wan doesn't let me do anything I want to, you know? I kind of get it because at the end of the movie, when the whole battle of other bug clone plan is going on um what genoa it's not genoa genoa is a place in italy geonosis thank you it's not the battle of genoa it's a place in italy like i said the battle of geonosis is going on you and mcgregor Hay- uh, hayden christensen and natalie portman are all on one ship and they're like you know dodging in and out of these trade federation ships and anakin says like shoot for the the point right above the fuel cells like hit that weak spot you know like he basically gives them the tactical strategy to take down a lot of those ships in one hit in a very efficient way and this works and in response Ewan McGregor as Obi-Wan says good call my young padawan in that moment i'm like dude i understand everything anakin is feeling what Ewan McGregor as Obi-Wan just said is the most offensive piece of dialogue you could say to somebody else. And I want to put this in perspective. You know, he calls him young Padawan. That's that's derisive and diminutive. Yeah. Full okay. force. Right after right after his advice probably killed like 50 people exactly. successfully. It's winning the war for them type of thing. But he also says, my. He says, my young padawan like he's influencing the fact that it's like i taught you this i i actually racked my brain because i watched this movie at least an hour before we started recording um i racked my brain about this 
this would be the equivalent of me teaching a student, because, of course, the Cinematics knows I've been a teacher for very many years. Um, this would be the equivalent of, like, I, I present something to my students, one of my students makes a good point, and I say to them the following quote. Good point, inferior dumb idiot. You know I taught you that, loser. Like, that's what it is. Like, Obi-Wan could have just said, good call to Anakin. End of story, right? But him saying, good call, my young Padawan. The fact that he's using my, the fact that he's using young, the fact that he's using Padawan, the fact that those words interplay with each other. Dude, that is so offensive. I get why Anakin is so upset. It would literally be, if I'm working with somebody... Because I, I not only in students, but I've worked with people in, um, you know, research um, perspectives where I've literally been the boss of people and I've like work on this, work on that thing. They could do they do good stuff. I've always tried to come back and praise them and be like, dude, you've done something that we couldn't do. That's why we hired you. That's why we want you. You know, you've changed this game in the way we wanted you to. Like I said, it is it is not me being hyperbolic. The way Ewan McGregor talks to Hayden Christensen in that last scene is the equivalent of me saying to a student, good point, inferior dumb idiot. You know I taught you that, right? It is so offensive. And I feel for the first time I understand where Anakin is coming from in this, his anger with Obi-Wan. Maybe all at not once, his anger with his mother, but his anger yeah. with Obi-Wan. It, all at once you realize he put up with that for 10 years and it was just too much after I, a while. <laughs> I, I, would, I don't know how you would do that for 10 years. I mean, but I then again, up, I put up with it for three years and I quit my goddamn job at Colorado State University because of that whole notion, yeah. you know? Well, but, but but then again, though, he in about five minutes after this, he doesn't listen to something Obi-Wan says and he loses an arm immediately. So, like, I don't I don't know. Obi-Wan pretty much knows what's up. Dude, here, here's my question. Here's my question. Would you rather lose more from being yourself or lose less by listening to somebody else? Well, we all know how it worked out in this case. No, no. Okay. Yeah, we do know how it worked out in this case, but I'm talking about the the actual personal perspective. Star Wars aside, I want to know from Zach. I want to know from Chris. Like, are you more of a person? Are you going to follow orders or are you going to take your own charge? This is getting real deep. I, I, I wanted to get real deep. Yeah. I think that that's one of the themes of this movie is Anakin being so angry about having a mentor. And you can handle a mentor two ways. You can disrespect them or respect them. I don't yeah. I honestly. And we could. I, I mean, I won't do this because I know, Chris, you're going to turn to a pumpkin in a few minutes. No. Um, well, it's I don't know. I, I, I don't I, want I, to talk about the middle ground. I want to know, yeah. like, if you have a, a higher up telling you how to do things, are you going to follow orders? Or are you going to do what you know is best? Well, I, I, I get, I, I get what you're saying. And I think the, 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 um, the interesting thing here is like, what you're talking about is like the, the, the tone of communications has a wildly undue impact on people's reactions. You could have for all functional purposes, the exact same relationship, but the same exchange is happening. In, sure. in a employee relationship, for example, the pay is the same, the job is the same, but the tone of the interactions makes you decide whether you want to work there or not, right? But, yep. but a uh, lot of people don't like to work with me because I'm very aggressive. Uh, <laughs> <on that fact. laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, you're there. You are there. You're like you should stop telling them. Uh, good idea, you stupid idiot. I taught you that. You know. <laughs> I probably should. You're right. You're right. Um. I say to a lot of people, you know, every time Zach and I do a good recording, you know, Zach makes the point. I'm like, Zach, that's a good point. I never thought of, but you're stupid, you know? I'm All right, Zach, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but, but Rob, but Rob went like near the end when this movie's wrapping up and Samuel Jackson comes out and says this party's over and then all the Jedi like jump out in the arena. Like that does nothing for you. Like, like nothing, yeah, really? nothing. I literally had to go to my fridge and crack open my third Red Bull of the day to stay awake for that moment, for sure. I I am so uninterested in this movie. This party's um, over. Like, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, if that if that if that uh, if that's true, you know, um, I don't know. Uh, we we 
this is like the most, you know, it's the most insane scenario that occurs. Like it's just wild craziness and a giant arena of bugs and I've, a bunch I've of Jedi honestly, fighting robots I've and brought clones. Up, I have very few notes for this movie. I, I did not do my full usual research for this movie because usually I watch the movie, I make my notes, my reactions in the moment, and I think of things. I'm like, oh, do I want to research that more, that type of thing? And usually after the fact, as Zach knows, um, I go through the Wikipedia page. I go through the IMDb trivia facts. I think if there's anything interesting, I'm going to dive into them more. I did not do that for any of this episode because, one, I knew you guys would be well more versed than I was in this stuff. But also, I'm I'm really sorry to say it because it's not it's not a category I throw myself into a lot. I fundamentally do not care about this movie. I wow. fundamentally do not care about this movie. And to be fair, I think I say that because I have such good friends. And I'm, when I say that, I mean you and I mean you, Zach and Chris, that care more about it than I do. I, I think specialization is a very important part of, you know, creating great. Okay, Zach, yet yeah, you're showing us a picture of episode. Okay, yes, you're showing yeah. us a poster, Zach. Stop it. The audience Rob, can't see this. Rob, okay. you know what I have? Rob, I can't swing my camera around, but you know what I have in front of me? A a wall-mounted Star Wars Episode II uh, ILM VFX crew shirt. That is cool. <laughs> and that's the thing. I love that yeah. you guys love this so much. Here's the well, thing. If you, Zach, and I, like me and Chris yeah. and Zach, if we did an episode on one 11-minute segment of Adventure Time, yeah, this would be the same discussion with all the boards flipped. You we guys should try go, it sometime. What the what the hell is the point of this? Why are you talking about I, this? I, I, I would I have so much lore to talk to you about. I'd have so much meaning for talked about. Yeah. It's just the idea that this is just not my cup of tea. I and and I think Zach is Zach, I'm sorry. I mean, with how much you know I have so many Star Wars figures, you know how much my parents love Star Wars. Even my mom loves the first Star Wars, hates all the rest of them, that type of thing. Um, if, if you remember Zach, my mom is like, Jabba the Hutt looks like a dirty person, you know, that type of thing. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think she said to that, she said that to us once when we were in like yeah. 11th grade or something, Zach, you know, it's like that. I just, I just don't care about this stuff. I respect <laughs> so much that you guys care about it, but well, this well, stuff I, see, grates on me like a, like a, like it's, braces. I on find a that penis in a blowjob type of thing. I, I, you don't I want it. Dealing. I find that <laughs> so. I find that. So, I had to. I had to do it. I'm sorry, Zach. But, but yeah, I guess ruin my paste but, paper. But Rob, you know how it's, you know how I was saying earlier, like 70 percent of my enjoyment of Star Wars is like the cultural aspects sure, of it. Sure, sure. Like this movie is like such a good example of that in terms of just like what a like enigma it is in cinematic history like in terms of firsts in terms of like just literally like the amount of money behind like the most cardboard character you interactions be, you could possibly you might imagine. be more aligned with zach in that respect because zach and i clearly since the inception of cinemodities have had very different ideas of what a cinemodity is you might be more leaning towards zach in the fact that you know this is just a crazy existence type of thing but i, I mean it's feel but, that way yeah do you, well, do you have any, like, 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 just the notion of, like, offices being CGI'd for, for no other reason than they could. Well, the, well, the first, I mean, it, the first movie to be shot digitally, for example. Well, I, I do want to, I'm glad you bring that up because I do have a lot of respect from the, the research that I have done on this movie and George Lucas throughout the years, because Zach knows there is one George Lucas movie I really want to talk about on recording. American Graffiti. Red Tails. Um, I really Rivers. want to talk about Red Tails. I really want to talk about that Which movie. he did not direct. He did. He shadow directed that movie. You cannot tell me he did not direct that movie. Um, I want to talk about the fact that him going on Oprah saying, nobody wanted to make this movie because it has black people in it. And Oprah was like, why is George Lucas saying this to me? <laughs> <laughs> I would love. I really want to talk about Red Tails, but Zach keeps coming at me with Star Wars movies. But the no, I, the 2032 Fort Year. Okay, and we look forward to that if we last that long. If um, if if Rob is alive that long, you know that type of thing. Um, but no, no. In terms of the actual CGI of this movie, 
That is something I respect immensely. From the research that I did, there was like tons of layers of like different almost disco balls trying to capture light, how they reflect on surfaces, yeah. how like light reflects on live action things. And I will I will say this. This might be my highest praise for this movie. Steven Spielberg and Jurassic Park is a garbage use of CGI. I hate when people say that the CGI in that movie is the best of an era or the groundbreaking that it is. Because the only reason people think that CGI is good is because it lasts 15 seconds on screen and they got the lighting right. And why did they get the lighting right? Because it was pitch black in the scenes they use CGI. This movie uses CGI in well-lit areas and they had to try to well-light that CGI, which they didn't do correctly. It still looks janky, don't get me wrong, but it is better than hiding your CGI through one light, one flashlight coming through the ground on a dinosaur's foot. And also, Chris, I don't know if you know this, dinosaurs never existed. Drop the mic. I I want so like we're gonna set it up so we're gonna do, um the, the why dinosaurs existed as a cinematic Patreon existed. exclusive never existed and uh well we're gonna have that debate uh, with a with a moderator of uh, of both our choosing that agrees to it uh, on cinematic <laughs> Patreon why, I don't know why you want that because everybody should agree dinosaurs do not exist. Can I please say the best like Rob Robism evolution don't, is the uh, don't say anything about dinosaur sack. They don't exist. What the best ra the best <laughs> evolution of a Robism is from why are we spending time and resources to study something that existed millions of years ago? Fast forward four years to this thing never existed, period. Oh, we uh, fast forward, for, <laughs> fast, forward <laughs> fast forward four years to an asteroid wiping out humanity because we didn't study what, what happened to dinosaurs. Oh no, 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 Chris, Chris, no, you are so wrong. Okay, I won't get into the, Chris. The asteroids. Yeah. Rob, did you you're, know that Boba Fett rode a giant dinosaur at one point? Uh, it's not a dinosaur. It's a fictional creation of the Star Wars <laughs> universe. It's not a dinosaur. <laughs> Um, no, but the honestly, High Republic authors. Honestly, Chris, Chris, I I have had this conversation with Ben off oh, mic, geez. and I have convinced Ben. Like my take on the fact that dinosaurs never existed is nearly foolproof. I have a I I have a a stance and a half on that dinosaurs never existed in an academic sense. Yeah, I'm and, guaranteed I prepared for it. Uh, from a, I, I don't require no, an academic uh, You know why I know you're that. not? Because you're Canadian, <laughs> and the Canadian government has lied a lot about dinosaurs in the past, and uh, I, I'm ready to talk about that, too. I'm ready to talk about <laughs> yeah, all the, the, all the best. Ant- I'm ready to talk about the different nations and their representations of dinosaurs, yeah. and they're all goddamn wrong. They're all Everybody wrong. Knows- uh, we're pretty. All, everybody knows all the best T Rexes are found in Canada. Can we all please? All the best say... T Rexes are found in multiple different places over the universe because nobody's ever found dinosaur bones next to each other, and that's a fact. I am ready to come at you. If we <laughs> want to do a dinosaur episode, I will I come mean, at you with I guest hosts only... that talk about I, this thing. No only... fact about dinosaurs anybody knows is real. <laughs> it's all movie magic, oh, dude. It's literally going to be what I'm known for at the end of the day. Dude, you forget about my cybersecurity work, which I'm famous for right now. You forget about all my statistical work. I'm going to be famous for years because I disprove dinosaurs. I swear to God, that's what I want to be known for. Don't, you know, don't uh, waste any more. You got to get that thesis out there because, like, at any moment we could, you know, at any moment. you 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 know, Chris, my problem is I can't publish papers while i work for the colorado department of revenue that's my biggest upsetting pseudonym thing. no they don't even let me do that I mean, if they can track it back to me they're really angry Del- okay, about okay. That shit. Del- delo felagates delo felagates <laughs> okay Zach, okay perfect please, okay please get I, us I, back on track i hear you somebody okay. mentioned dinosaurs and i lost okay. my mind i'm Great. sorry <laughs> so R- rob there's no way you didn't enjoy the fact that Jar Jar is responsible for the creation of the clone army and as such the dawn of the empire. Um Misa about to bust a nut for uh strong powers of the senator? Is that right? 
Yeah, like, did did Lucas cause Jar Jar to start the Empire just well, because people didn't like him well, in episode I'm, one? I'm glad you bring that up because I think that there is a, a big notion in this movie specifically about, you know, political power play. Of course, politics in Star Wars is a, a big thing throughout, I think, the entire series. But I think there is a big highlight on it, you know, in this movie and also Revenge of, Revenge of the Sith. Isn't there a line where Natalie Portman says, like, this is how democracy dies with like cheering applause or something like that, you know? Yeah, there is, but I get those two movies confused easily. I, I, I've never seen either of them. I swear to God. Um, but no, I mean the idea that like politics plays such a big idea in star Wars. I think that's part of the reason I found it so boring is that they put too much effort into trying to make it political rather than making it, you know, eventual, if that makes sense. Did you did you find that you were at odds with the political message being presented not, to you? Not really. I mean, that might be my fault because I love um, Senator Always Drink Your Ovaltine type of thing. And I want him to become Darth Sidious at the end of the day. Like, I love Ian McDermott, you know? His performance is probably my favorite thing from the prequels and the sequels and the trequels and the quatrels, whatever the hell we're calling it these days. I mean, I love, uh, as you and Zach have said, you know, unlimited power. Like, I love that over the top type of of stuff. And to see him do this stuff. And that's why I quoted it, you know, very easily at the start of this episode. I could have quoted the sand line. I don't like sand. It's coarse and rough and irritating. And it gets everywhere. Not like you. I could have quoted that. But I chose to quote Ian McDermott at the end of this movie when he gets the, um, you know, the vote to give him full power, ultimate power. And he says, I love democracy. I love the Republic. And it's like, no, you don't. No, you don't. Get out of here. I, I, I love that character. He might be my favorite character in the series. Um, other than probably Mace Windu. Mace Windu is just kind of good fun because he sticks to his guns and then dies because of it in the third movie, if that makes sense. I've never heard those two characters directly compared before in my life. <laughs> I don't know if I directly compared them. I compared them as my favorite characters. Yeah, but I mean, it's just such a weird like number. That's they, such a weird number. They were number juxtaposed two. in a conversation. Yeah. Okay, I'm, yeah, with you. But, I'm with you. Yeah. You know, I hear you. It's just like Mace Wind. Yeah, Mace Windu like barely registers as a character to me. But until Palpatine the third being movie. number one, until I hear Revenge you. of the Sith, yeah. like Mace Windu has nothing to do until that third movie, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, that, and even even then, it's like he makes a couple questionable choices, and then and then bites the dust. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I, he's, I like, in, he's in the, the best scene of Star Wars in all time. The um, you know, why would you go against the Senate? I am the Senate. That's my favorite scene. I have to say. Um, no, I actually have to say my favorite scene. To to be in all honesty, you know, because I've said it before, and I have to say it to Chris and Zach again. My favorite scene is when Emperor Ovaltine is lightning shocking Luke at the end of Return of the Jedi and Darth Vader decides to turn and throw Emperor Ovaltine over the uh, balcony. That is one of my favorite moments in cinematic history. I love that moment in Return of the Jedi. I love that because it's one of the things that, you know, I've said before on this podcast and I'll say it again. It's something I've heard other people say. You when you watch a movie you love so much that has like a big twist at the end, even though you know the twist, you love the fact that you watch it. And you go, is it going to happen? Is it going to happen? Every time I watch Return of the Jedi, which is not very frequently, I watch that last battle between Luke and Vader. And when Vader gets the upper hand, when the Emperor starts shocking Luke, and Luke Mark Hamill is in such pain, I'm like. Is, is is Vader going to save him? Is Vader going to save him? I know Vader's going to save him, save him, but I love it so much. And when Vader does that thing and throws him over Emperor Ovaltine over the edge, you know, always drink your Ovaltine, that type of thing. He throws him over the edge. It is so fantastic to me. And um, right. I think it's the only reason that I'm actually involved in this podcast anymore yeah. with with zach well, and you know you guys because i love that moment so much well that th- like that's that's a great highlight to to the listeners you know as as uh as belligerent and rude about this whole subject as rob has been so far <laughs> you, you with that with that one little sentence you sort of understand that he actually gets it 
like like he actually appreciates the actual ending of the star wars saga and before the fan fiction begins like that is the that is it, you know you? He, he did you had to ruin it <laughs> he, he's he, yeah he actually appreciates i don't even like the um, the, as Zach the, knows, the uh, narrative I conclusion very of much the dislike star wars the saga. end of so Empire you know he's been a little back. harsh on it but that he does whole battle it. where luke is just jumping up like he's oh, a oh we can only hope he's right oh thank god and, and he's gone and it's like very all right so like you want to do like a semi cinemodies related wrap up yeah but cinemodies there's no way we need him part of it so this has to i have to gonna come back the end of return of the jedi where he'll it be takes, back like actually yeah he's already coming back in to challenge a character i hope so because that is meaningful okay so you were you just disappeared for like 10 seconds rob just so you know well okay fuck me I what did you say was it good i hope so <laughs> it picked up on my end it picked up on my end and, and um, okay maybe it's maybe it did you'll be able to isolate it yeah we'll give if, it to zach we'll give it to zach he, yeah. he's gonna record this or edit this episode type of uh-huh, thing um uh-huh <laughs> Zach goes, I'll edit this episode. <laughs> no, but I uh, I mean Remember, maybe Rob, too, I don't um... have to edit this for Knights of Vader. I can always just can this for Knights of Vader and be like, hey Rob, this is cinema these nonsense. No, please please, Zach, do not do not get Knights of Vader in the hole that Cinemodities is in right now. Please do not. Oh, because we're in a hole and a half uh type of thing. All right, Rob, um, we have to, I, Rob, let's wrap this up. Yeah, yeah, I guess with that being said, if um you guys had anything else to say about Attack of the Clones, please do it now. Um, You can see that the Jedi are sowing the seeds of their own destruction in the very last scene when they're like, you know, we should probably not let anybody know that our ability to use the Force is like not good anymore and uh, our enemies are going to multiply. They're already making bad decisions. They're in the council chambers. They're they're conspiring to hide their weaknesses and the writings on the wall. It's a dark ending of yeah, this movie. Yeah. In, in terms of contemporary discussion, uh, I think that would fall into the category of Yoda has the big gay, if that makes sense. Um, <laughs> well, that has to be it. <laughs> uh, I also want to say before we get to the final thoughts on this episode, Chris, uh, we are at two oh two right now, so we have broken two hours. And um, uh, as far as I'm looking at my end. Uh, free Zencaster has not bothered us at all. So, dude, I will not pay <laughs> for <laughs> you know a new. I, I will not pay soon. for Zencaster until they start to bother us. We're just getting the question. Fantastic. This. We're yeah, steamrolling past him. If that Absolutely. Comes down to it. We're doing yeah. our questions. So, with all that being yeah, said, still, let's like, get to the problem is he's and late night. And I want to so go last. So I want to throw it over to our guest, Chris. Cinemonities late night for it still Attack says it's recording. Clones. What do you think? Oh, yeah. Can we hope that it's not recording? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <man>. All right. <clears throat> Shit. Why well, do I feel like this is gonna be similar to the Venom discussion, where it just basically just ends abruptly? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, for for your editing sanity, I, we might as well just do that. <laughs> Some people, I mean, you know, I don't know. Like R- Rob's irreverence, I, I think people in- enjoy it. So the I fact that he does not care about any of this stuff, I hope so. I hope I don't so. Know. <laughs> like he could, <laughs> if, if it was more judiciously placed for comedic effect, that might be improvement. But the dinosaur thing is becoming this weird fascination where I just, I, I just don't know where it began or like what, why the intensity to the point where I'm like, Rob, was there a, a trip to the, uh, the museum yeah. once that just went horribly, horribly South for you? It's, you know, it's, it's more, it's almost more offensive than saying you guys never went to the moon. I, I, like I, f- I think it makes it so funny. It's just like the dinosaurs thing is like something that like people have such a beloved like adoration for. And yet he's somehow taken this thing that's pretty innocuous, like, and he's just gonna die on that hill. Yeah. Well, I mean it's not really innocuous because like it, you might as well throw it like all of science if you don't think dinosaurs are real. Cause like it's that stupid. I but... think the thing though to one, it's recording now. Uh my audio is picking up. Can I get a test from you? Chris? Hello, hello. 10-4. Okay, perfect. Looks like all the waveforms are picking up. Well, let's jump right back into it. With all that being said, let's answer our questions. Zach, Cinemodities and Late Night for Attack of the Clones. What do you think? Cinemodities, no. 
late night movie i'm leaning towards no because i think i think on the bizarre star wars spectrum it is rather dry okay. for a cinemonies film for as like as as, as something like that yeah, cause I don't think there's anything – we've talked about it a few times, the idea of I think uh, going through the turnstiles when we get to Lilo and Stitch, we mentioned the notion. <laughs> of, Zach, I don't know what you're talking about. I've never seen that movie before. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you mean the level in Kingdom Hearts? That doesn't exist? Exactly. Uh, the, the Turo Grand Station in Birth by Sleep? Absolutely. <laughs> So, no, I, I think it's the notion of even if you haven't watched this in about like 10, 15 years, I think Rob's kind of proven the point that there isn't anything revelatory about this. There's nothing kind of like, oh, my God, look at this whole layer of subtext that I was never privy to as a child. Um, again, goofy fun, but neither Cinemati nor Late Night Movie. OK, OK. Uh, Chris, what do you think for Cinemati's and Late Night Movie? Well, you, you guys, you put me in a bit of an awkward position, right? Because Which is what we like, although you know? I think there's, I think there's something very tangibly bizarre and off kilter, you might say, about this movie. If the two hosts of Cinemodities say it's not a Cinemodity, how can I, <laughs> as I preempt Rob's response, how can I very well say that it is? But there's just something bizarre about it that, um, that that you can just feel that it's not it doesn't have the veneer of the sort of a level uh movies of its period you know we were you were talking about dinosaur movie by steven spielberg like it's there's something weirder about it than something like that and it's i I don't it doesn't lie in the dialogue necessarily or like the the literal events but there's just something bizarre about it that's that feels a little riskier than dinosaur movie by Steven Spielberg, for example. That's fair. I, I would agree with that as well. Absolutely. And um, it, it, I think I have already said my answers to this question when the hosts were kicked off for internet connectivity reasons. Um, but if not, I'll put it in a correction later, but let's just jump right in snacks for the restaurant. Let's talk about the cinematis restaurant. And we have to start with Chris because Chris, you are not the um, owner of the restaurant you are a guest here um what snacks or events or anything would you like to add to the cinematis restaurant based on attack of the clones all right so um a appetizer that is like candied sliced pears and maybe uh jawa juice because as a cynical 13 year old when i heard when i heard jawa juice in, in dex's diner I was kind of annoyed because I was like, I'm taking Star Wars very seriously at the time. I, I know I, I asked I, you think... guys this earlier, and I, I like yeah. the, the first candy thing you said, but Jawa Juice, we had to bring up. I did not watch this with subtitles, so I was just going off like what I heard. Is Does that robot like waitress say to Obi-Wan, do you want Jawa? Is it Jawa Juice? It It is, and it shouldn't be. Because, you know, like I was saying, it's like cynical. I, I was even I was ready to hate that as a 13 year old because my attitude was like Jawas are like dirtbags who live on Tatooine. There's Whoa, not a drink named. Chris. <laughs> there's not <laughs> there's Jeez, not a drink. There, there's not a drink named after them on Coruscant. I don't believe it. Suspension of disbelief obliterated. No, those people don't know that Jawas. Exist. So my thought so there shouldn't... was because I also heard Jawa juice. and I'm happy to know it now is actually Jawa juice. I think that we should go just very much balls to the wall. We should have Jawas, individual Jawas, like full, you know, bodies of Jawas. We put them in a little kind of self-contained room. The room compresses on itself. What I'm saying is that we should squeeze the living Jawas for their liquid, basically. Like the trash compactor? Exactly. I'm Like, if anybody is familiar with apple presses, banana presses, I've actually done some work with banana presses in the last few weeks. Uh, they're you... gross because I'm allergic to bananas and I can't eat those things. Um, I am literally saying we put a Jawa in a room, and the room compresses onto the Jawa, and the liquid drains through the floorboards, whether it be blood, whether it be water, whether it be Jawa juice, and that all goes in to a fine beverage for our patrons. Do we do you know what to get the hair out? 
Do you do you want to know what Jawa juice actually we're, is? In we're going to have to have a filter to get the hair out. It'll be a it'll be a homogenous drink, Zach. Absolutely, but no, Chris. I would like to know if there is a Star Wars answer to what Jawa juice is. Absolutely. It 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 would be better if it was what you said. It is. <laughs> it is. It is essentially beer, but it is bantha hides mashed together with fermented grains. So it's like leather, like sitting in in beer. So I don't, I like, I don't even understand. Like, a, there's some author in the last twelve years who's to blame for that answer, and I want to find out who they are and yell at. Here's them. my problem with what you're saying to me, Chris, is that I would honestly, physically drink that. That's my problem. <laughs> is there is there some sort of real world craft beer like niche that is like putting like animal hides in their in their beer? Absolutely. Absolutely. There are leather bound barrels that whiskey goes through in parts of the country. Absolutely. Yep. So I'm I was basically what I'm showing is how uncultured I am, but I still find that to be disgusting. It is absolutely disgusting uh, because okay. I don't care what alcohol tastes like. And Zach, Zach, I hold on, let me pull up the uh, the camera again. Zach, yeah, Zach, okay, Zach is totally looking at his phone, ignoring me. Zach knows I don't care what the alcohol went through. I want it in my liver, absolutely. Um, and we also and we also know that you love banthas uh, and you are uh, very yes, amused by them course, whenever you see of them. Of course. Um, the only other snack that I had was a magical floating CGI fruit. <laughs> I would love for our customers if they want a piece of fruit that it just floats over to them magically, and when they bite into it, they are clearly two inches off of biting into it, and it somehow appears in their mouth. Uh, this movie is a nightmare, everybody. Any, Zach's, uh, Chris, what other snacks did you have for the restaurant? I want something with the clones, like an incubation tube. Like, I feel like, Rob, it's like the entire like plot beat that we completely skipped over. Man, I, I avoid these things because they are legitimately war crimes. Just because we are underground where Mars 2112 was doesn't mean we can avoid the war crime statute of the United Nations. We can't start to clone people. Oh, just that's, that's we're the underground. line. You're telling you of all the atrocities committed in the name of Cinemati. No, no, I'm not is. saying of all the atrocities. I'm saying that we, we should not rely on the word processor of the gods to protect ourselves this often. We need to bank those thoughts, right? Like, if, I don't if know. We... I, I like the idea of just like, a, oh god, a like incubating human, like in, in like a glass jar of goo. Zach, you know I like that too. <laughs> you know I I would do that on my own, regardless of the restaurant. You know I would. You know, Zach, I would love the chance has, to raise a child who is afraid like, of the color green. Trying to, trying to create a human being in the window. Exactly. Seat. You know, I would love to do a psychological experiment of raising a child from birth who does not like the color green and then release them into the wild and see what that means. <laughs> but that's not ethically viable. But we can't well, do no, that in an ethical, army, viable man. sense unless we reveal like ourselves in the restaurant. We can't do that. I think Rob is a true Phantom Menace. I, think... <laughs> I love the fact that like every point we had to make for the three of us was overlapped by everybody else's voices. Um, well, with that being said, Zach, would you like to inform the audience about what we're talking about next week, if you even know? Scooby Dooby Doo. Is that really? Where what's next are week? you? Okay. I thought Lulu and Stitch was next week, so excuse no. me. Um, nope. But tune in next week. Cinemodities will be around for as long as you want it to be. I am so Please stop thankful. contributing to the Patreon. Please pull Please. your money. Please don't this stop. Is a yes, yes. Of course, as, as the Cinemodians knows, Rob has gotten well behind on editing. Uh, the Patreon we've kept up on, you know, that type of thing. And you're getting just kind of weird episodes all across the board, that type of thing. I mean, you know, Ben and I have done a lot of episodes about animation that have still just are coming out like rapid fire at this point. We're so happy that you want to listen to us and want to um, hear what we have to say. And I'm so glad that, you know, for these next few months, Zach and I get to, uh, uh, you know, argue with each other because that's something that uh, 
Uh, Zach and I arguing is very different from Ben and I arguing, that type of thing. But if you want to hear more from us, please, of course, you'll get a whole slew of bonus episodes, extra episodes, through Patreon at www.patreon.com slash cinemodities. If you want to argue with us or complain to us at how we're missing deadlines, anything, I'm looking at you, Carlos, that type of thing, it is cinemodities at gmail.com. With all that being said, Zach, when you are not yelling at Rob about how we should love Star Wars, where can people find you? There's a Cinemodities Twitter account that I look at daily. Daily? That's a big... Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. That's pretty cool. Well, I guess check that out. What is it? <laughs> it at Cinemodities at Twitter yes, dot yes. Twitter dot Twitter? Two M's, one D. You know, at Cinemodities dot Twitter dot argue? Whatever Twitter is these days, you know, that type of thing? The, the weird thing is that the at Cinemodities on Twitter is very pro-dinosaur, so it's very... It conflicts the podcast well, uh, I take back morality. everything I said. I take back everything I said. <laughs> Chris, when people want to hear your take on why dinosaurs have never existed, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me uh, arguing for dinosaurs on the Cinemodities Patreon. And you can also that hasn't find happened me at yet. The, <laughs> it's it. I'm trying to I'm trying to will trying it into will existence. It, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and uh, you can also find me at the Chris Porteous on Instagram. And if you would like some some uh, vaguely pro Star Wars content, you can check out the Knights of Vader fo- podcast and follow KOV podcast on. We Instagram. really have to do that dinosaur thing because Ben and I get way too heated. Every week when we talk about dinosaurs, we get way too heated. Rob, I'm so into it. We'll do we'll do why dinosaurs exist, why aliens are here on Earth, and why you're, a secular world is paramount. Bat comparing two things that are incomparable. Yes, aliens exist on Earth, but dinosaurs literally never existed. <laughs>